Do we know if Commissioner Spellman will be joining us? He will not. Did you? I sent an email out earlier. Um, I don't think he is. He's not. Um, I'm sorry. I sent an email email out earlier. He's um, he's not going to be with us this evening. He's what? He will not be with us this evening. He had oh, some, okay. Something pressing came up. And it's seven o'clock. So if you want me to start the webinar, I can go ahead and do that. Would you please? Okay. Now we're live. So is the meeting ready to be called to order? Yes. I'd like to call the September 3rd meeting of the Santa Cruz City Planning, a regular meeting of the Santa Cruz City Commission to order. We have a roll call, please. Commissioner Conway? Here. Nielsen? Here. Greenberg? I can see you. <laughs> Commissioner Greenberg? She's muted. <coughs> Sorry, I thought I did that on my phone. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dawson? Here. Maxwell? Here. Selman? Chair Schifrin? Here. Then we'll move to absent with uh, notification. I, uh, Commissioner Selman is. Um, are, there's an item here that says staff. What's supposed to happen with that item? Is the staff going to identify itself? No, staff is supposed to have taken that off and did not. So you can skip over that. Sorry about that. No problem. Are there any statements of disqualification? None. We'll now move to oral communications. This is the time for anyone to speak on an item that is not on the commission's agenda for tonight, but is appropriately before the commission. And um, I ask that you identify yourself and you'll have three minutes to provide testimony. Are there uh, people on the call who would like to um, testify during oral communications? Please raise your hand. For the members of the public, uh, this is the clerk. If you'd like to speak at oral communications, please press star nine now. This is for oral communications. Okay, I see um, two members of the public have indicated they wish to speak at oral communications. I'll start with the first one. Okay, go forward. If you give us your name, that'd be appreciated. I don't think that Mr. Lawler wanted to speak at oral communications, but he has his hand up. So unless he wants to speak at oral communications, I'll move on. Oh, there it went down. So there's one other um, person. And there we go, Chair. Speaker, you're on the line. You have to unmute yourself and be, to start speaking so we can hear you. We can hear you now, Speaker. Go ahead. I see. Um, can, can, can you hear me now? Public have indicated yes. they wish to speak oral communication. Hello? I'll start with the first one. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I think I'm getting double sound. That's what was my. Um, I wanted to call to speak on behalf of the 418 project as a really vital part of the riverfront of downtown Santa Cruz. Could and I interrupt a, a, you? That is on the agenda for tonight um, when we discuss the uh, have the public hearing on the 418 Front Street project. So you'll have an opportunity to speak during that item. So if it's uh, I ask you to wait until then since this is oh not yeah no no problem no i thought problem. this was time i was confused there okay great is there anyone else who wants to uh speak during oral communications 
I do not see any other members of the public that have raised their hand. Okay, seeing, uh, seeing and hearing no one, we'll move on to announcements. One of the realities with uh, this kind of Zoom uh, technology is I think we have to be flexible about oral communications because sometimes people can get on the line and they come late. So uh, I'll ask the clerk to let us know if anybody contacts her and wants oral communication. So are there any announcements? Um, the the caller is not on mute. The one six one two is still not up. There we go. Thank okay. you. Any Hearing about none. Uh, any Chair, someone just raised their hand. Would you like me to allow them to speak? Okay, as long as they know it's oral communications. So unmute yourself and start talking. Please give us your name and you have up to three minutes for an item that's not on the agenda. Speaker with your hand raised, you need to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Okay, they've lowered their hand. <laughs> Sorry, Chair. Please continue. Well, let's moving right along. Um, let's go to approval of the minutes, but there aren't any minutes, I don't think. I don't remember seeing them. No. Um, so we'll go past the consent agenda because there uh, are no consent agenda items. We'll move on to uh, general business and have a public hearing on 418, 428, 440, 504, 508 Front Street. Um, and could we please have a staff report? Yes, good evening, Chair Schiffer and members of the Planning Commission. Just give me one second while I can share my screen. Can everyone see the slides? Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Um, so thank you. This is the um, project that we refer to as the Front Riverfront Mixed Use Project. Um, this is a project that requires approval of a non-residential demolition authorization permit, a tentative map, a design permit, a special use permit, an administrative use permit, a coastal permit, a revocable license for an outdoor extension area, a heritage tree removal permit, um, and then approval of tree tree removal also. Um, it requires a recommendation of approval from the Historic, Planning Commission, Historic Preservation Commission and a recommendation from the Planning Commission and then final approval by the City Council. Um, this is the project that in yellow, it's on the east side of Front Street between Front Street and the San Lorenzo River. It is in the downtown area, so it's surrounded by um, other buildings of significant height. Um, the Palomar is seven stories and 95 feet. With 1010 Pacific, that is six stories and 68 feet. Uh, 1547 Pacific is five stories and 50 to 60 feet. And then most recently, we've approved um, the building at the corner of Pacific Front Street and Laurel Street that is up to 85 feet at the mezzanine level. Um, and this map here is intended to show you the areas of the additional height zones downtown. This project site is an additional height zone B, which allows heights up to 70 feet um, under specific conditions. Across the street is the height zone A, so that allows up to 85 feet under specific conditions as well. Um, so this is a project that would provide 175 residential condos. Um, that includes 53 studios, 89 one-bedrooms, 33 two-bedrooms. Uh, these are maps 
condos, but they're likely to be rented according to the applicant. Um, the project also includes 11,500 square feet of commercial space that would front on Front Street and face the River Walk, um, and the creation of a publicly accessible landscaped open space area between the building and the path. Um, it would also include two pedestrian passageways that connect Front Street and the river and um, will create outdoor courtyard areas and gathering areas. Um, these are long desired connections between the downtown core Front Street and the River Walk. The building is proposed to be seven stories, so six stories above the ground floor commercial at Front Street and then five stories of commercial at the River Walk frontage. The total height is 77 feet, nine inches. The project doesn't include any disturbance uh, on the river side of the levee or in the river channel. Um, all the disturbance would be on the south side of the levee where it still would be located. Um, the pedestrian passage ways um, essentially break up the building into three separate buildings. And you can see from the rendering here that they provide a unique but compatible architectural style. Um, the buildings are actually all connected by a basement and ground level parking garage. So this project complies with all of the requirements in the downtown plan, with the exception of some site standards that are um, requested here as incentive concessions, waivers, um, I'll describe those in just a moment. And then um, also one standard that's requested as a design variation, which is allowed in the downtown plan and um, requires a recommendation of approval from the planning director and approval by the city council. I'm having to move this around a little. Um, this standard this is the design variation. Uh, this standard has to do with the location of the south pedestrian passageway. So the downtown plan requires that these publicly accessible connections are located within 50 feet of the Front Street intersections at the terminus of Cathcart Street and the extensions of Maple and Elm Street. So um, Maple Street is much further south and so it's not perpendicular to the project site. The north pedestrian passageway is located at the terminus of Cathcart, so it is in line with the plan requirements. Um, but the South Pedestrian Passageway is not within 50 feet of the future extension of Elm Street. So I have here on this aerial photo, Elm Street shown in a red dash line. Um, we're uh, assuming that uh, an extension of Elm Street would just be a straight path to Front Street, but it's, it's really unclear at this time if that would be located further north or south. Um, but assuming a straight path, uh, it would, um, result in the South Passageway being located about 80 to 100 feet from the extension rather than 50 feet. Um, if that path was relocated south to meet this requirement, the result would be a much larger center building and then sort of a tall, narrow southern building. Um, they would also have to relocate the driveway uh, to the garage, which would locate it sort of right in the middle of a row of commercial spaces. So. Um, for these reasons, we find that the proposed location of the South Passageway is adequate. Um, the project's located directly across the street from um, the Metro Center and within walking distance, distances of every, all these other areas. So um, the design variation is supported by the uh, planning director, and we're also recommending that the planning commission recommend approval of the design variation to the city council. There we go. Um, this is a view project site from the Laurel Street Bridge. So um, as I said, this is the additional height zone B. It allows for buildings to exceed the base height of 55 feet up to 70 feet and five floors above ground floor commercial, subject to specific criteria in the downtown plan. Um, this project, however, is also eligible for a density bonus. Um, there's no density commercial business district, zone district, or the RVC general plan designation, but there are development standards that regulate the size of the building, and so um, the number that can build within this area is less than the standards. 
Um, so the applicant submitted plans um, that portrayed a project that was consistent with all of the development standards for the site, including the height that's permitted in the additional height zone. And those plans established a base number of 130 constructed without any request for incentives, concessions, or waivers. Now, this project is being complete before the adoption of the current ordinance, so it falls under the prior inclusionary requirement of 15%. Um, so the project is required to provide 15% or 20 units as inclusionary units at the low income level of 80% AMI. Um, the project is eligible for a density bonus because the applicant is um, electing to provide 11% of the 133 units, so it's 15 units, at the very low income level, 50% AMI, and then the remaining five units would be maintained at the low income level required by the inclusionary ordinance. Um, and so a question that's often raised is if um, the required inclusionary units can also be counted as the affordable units for the purposes of the density bonus eligibility. Um, and the answer to that is yes, they can be double counted. And um, I believe that we provided you with a memo that outlines the case law on that issue, as well as um, the opinion of two different attorneys on the matter. And so we do feel confident that it is permitted. Um, so because this is eligible for a density bonus, um, they're also eligible to request incentive concessions and waivers as a part of the project. Section 24.16.255, subsection two is, um, a section of the density bonus code that allows for an applicant to seek approval of specified incentives and concessions without any requirement for them to demonstrate that the incentives or concessions result in identifiable and actual cost reductions to the project. Um, this section is very specific about what those incentive, con incentive concessions are. And one is to allow for a 20% reduction in yard setback. Um, while there are no yard requirements in the CBD district. There are required step backs and these function similarly, similarly to a yard um, in that it's a required open area um, for the purposes of providing light, air and privacy. So um, one such step back in the downtown plan is a 10 foot step back requirement above 35 feet in the pedestrian passageway. Um, the North passageway meets this step back requirement the South Passageway, um, you can see where the building goes up and then the building steps back, except for they have this um, um, elevator shaft. They have one on each side that encroach into that step back area. Um, and so the applicant is proposing to allow those as the incentive concession. Um, the proposed reduction is equal to about and a half percent of the full step back area. So um, under density bonus law, the applicant is eligible for this reduction. Um, the project also includes waivers. Uh, the density, bo a density bonus waiver allows for an applicant to request a waiver from any development standard with evidence that the, the standard physically precludes the construction of the development with the density bonus unit. Um, the applicant is requesting waivers to a requirement that the building step back 10 feet above 50 feet at Front Street and River Front frontages. Um, and they're also requesting to allow a building height greater than 70 feet. Um, so as evidence for um, these waivers, they provided these diagrams. Um, these demonstrate the effects of the setbacks on the development. And they provided uh, a diagram such as this for floors five, six, and seven, um, which are all levels above 50 feet. Um, this is the top floor diagram. Um, it shows the step backs in red, and um, it indicates that 17 units would be lost if the project complied with all of the step back requirements. The applicant has designed the project to and above the maximum standards, and they've also designed a project with smaller units overall than the base project. Um, and so that was enough justification to demonstrate that the step backs and the height limitations would um, absolutely preclude the construction of the project with the density bonus units. Um, otherwise, the project meets the design requirements. It's fully parked. 
um, and it provides the required number of new trees planted to mitigate the removal of three heritage trees. Um, so this is a view of the project site with um, it's 1010 Pacific in the foreground there. Um, the site consists of three existing buildings. They're all single story buildings. Um, the proposal is to demolish all three buildings. Uh, the 504 Front Street at the north, that was evaluated by a historic consultant and it was determined to not be eligible for listing locally um, or in the California Register of Historic Resources or in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, 418 and 428, however, were determined to be historic buildings. Um, they have uh, historically significant features that were identified at 418. It's the Mission Revival Art Deco architecture. And the historian called out the stepped cornice, curved parapet, Art Deco detailing. Um, those were the primary historic characteristics. And then the form, shape, and massing of the building was a secondary, um, primary, or a secondary historic characteristic. Um, at 428 front, the architecture is streamlined, modern, and um, the historic characteristics are the streamlined horizontality of the building, and then the T-shaped massing and roof lines were secondary characteristics. So the project includes the demolition of these two buildings, and the demolition of historic buildings is considered to be a significant impact under the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. Um, most of the other impacts that are associated with the project we found to have been analyzed in a previously certified environmental impact reports for the general plan and the downtown plan. Um, but the demo of the historic resources required further analysis in an environmental impact report. Um, we did review alternatives as part of that document. Um, and the intent is to look for alternatives that reduce the impacts to less than significant. The first alternative that we looked at was uh, partial preservation. So this included deconstructing the facades of the buildings, storing the materials off site, and then reconstructing the facades on the new building. Um, the, the buildings would have to be relocated from their current location due to the location of the pedestrian passageways. And the concerns of the historian with this option were that the buildings would lose their representation as whole buildings and that the effect of a seven story building constructed around the facade would not be consistent with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Um, a second alternative that we reviewed was relocation off site. Um, that includes deconstructing the buildings and then constructing, reconstructing the buildings off site in a location of similar um, qualities to this one. So along Front Street and adjacent to the river. Um, so the concerns with this one, uh, with this option, were that the, the structural engineer was unsure if the buildings could be physically moved given the, their size and materials. Um, and then we found that there were no offsite parcels with these qualities that were available for such relocation. Um, and then for these two alternatives, the applicant determined that these were not also not likely um, economically feasible. Uh, we also reviewed a no project alternative. That's a requirement of CEQA. Um, obviously this option would have no impact to the buildings, um, but it wouldn't allow for the construction of the project. And um, the project does meet um, and implement several longstanding goals and policies of the city. So the project was heard by the Historic Preservation Commission and uh, they agreed that the partial preservation of the building, so the um, location, relocation of the facades onto the new building would not be consistent with the Secretary of the Interior Standards. However, they were concerned with the loss of the building. And so they voted to recommend that the building facades of the historic buildings are portrayed on the front facade of the new building. Um, this is in addition to the recommended mitigation measure that um, the applicant uh, implement photo documentation and an interpretive display on the site. Uh, so the applicant uh, pulled out the um, historic characteristics of the building that were called out in the historic report um, to replicate on the new building. Um, the elements that they used uh, are the stepped cornice, the Art Deco design, and then they also added some of the window and door designs here. So this is a rendering of what 
a replication of the building at 418 Front would look like on the new building. Um, and then 428 Front, um, they pulled out the horizontal lines um, and window designs and then added a curved awning at the side to replicate the curved element at the end. So again, this one is showing 428 Front on the new building. Um, this one is a little hard to see, but it does show uh, the original um, elevation at the top and the um, proposed new ele front elevation on Front Street with the buildings relocated at the ground level. Um, so you can see the archways were replaced with the 418 building and the 428 building um, replacing the square archways at the bottom. And so both of the pedestrian passageways have stairs that are uh, proposed to lead pedestrians up to the river walk level. And then to accommodate bikes, a bike rail is proposed along the stairs. Um, I have an example here of some bike rails. These are um, troughs that are provided along the stairs um, that allow for bikers to push their bikes up the stairs. In the event that that's not feasible for a biker, there is elevator access to the river walk in the south building. Um, and then there's also two level access points to the river walk at the Laurel Street Bridge and the Soquel Avenue Bridge, um, which are located at both ends of the block. Um, the stairways are support, supported by the downtown plan. Um, the downtown plan states that the passageways shall be predominantly pedestrian in nature and consistent with the San Lorenzo Irvin River plan that encourages the pedestrian and or bike connections to the river walk. Um, so they've provided both here with the bike rail and the stairs. Uh, we also support the design of the staircases as a, a more inviting um, pedestrian feature than something like a uh, longer switchback bike ramp. Um, I'm not gonna read through these. I just wanted to provide you with a list of the policies that would be implemented directly by this plan. Um, this is a list of the policies that are in the San Lorenzo Urban, Urban River Plan. Um, specifically the Front Street significant riverfront areas. And then this is the general plan, uh, local coastal program and downtown plan policies that would be implemented as well. Um, so I believe that you've received all of the public correspondence that we've received for this project. Um, I do have a couple corrections on the conditions of approval. Um, condition of approval number 72, um, it states that the permit allows for the service of alcohol or live entertainment. That should be the permit does not allow for the service of alcohol or live entertainment. Um, a future tenant that wanted to provide that service would need to apply for a permit for that. Um, and then number 65 just has a typo in it, uh, residential portion of the on-site parking um, and then not be is repeated there. So I'm proposing to clean that up. Um, and so the staff recommendation is for the Planning Commission to uh, recommend that the City Council um, adopt the resolution certifying the environmental impact report, um, adopt the resolution adopting the findings of facts, mitigation, monitoring, and reporting program, and the statement of overriding considerations, and uh, the adoption of the resolution approving the project with the design amendments proposed by the applicant to meet the Historic Preservation Commission and um, based on the findings and the corrected conditions of approval. Um, so the applicant is here with their team. We also have our um, uh, city's environmental consultant. So um, hopefully we can answer any questions we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that, that closes the staff presentation? Yes, thank you. Are uh, there questions from commissioners of uh, the staff or should we hear from the, um, well, why don't we hear if there are any uh, commissioner questions uh, to the staff? Uh, Commissioner Dawson? Yes, I was wondering if you could clarify where the methodology to cal calculate base density is um, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that for now. Yes, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I didn't include that in, in your report, but um, they actually provided a full set of plans that were um, 
for a project that met all of the site standards and development standards for the downtown plan. So it was a fully conforming project. Um, it did meet the height requirements for the additional height zone. So we did factor that in, but um, it met all the other step back requirements, the um, required reductions in the top floor. Um, so that was a fully conforming project. And so um, we relied on the development standards of the site to um, be the limiting factors for the number of units that could be constructed there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, yes. I have a question. Um, Samantha, um, since Commissioner Spellman's not here, I'm going to ask, I'll ask the question because <laughs> he usually asks this question. Um, in terms of site sections, um, were uh, was this applicant required to provide site sections through the adjacent um, parcels? Um, I don't believe that we got site sections through the adjacent parcels, although we might have those on the civil plans where um, they uh, uh, display the um, fill structure. Um, I, can, I can look at the plans and see if they're in there, but they would be included in the packet as the civil drawings if they were. Okay. We did receive for the building. You did? Sorry, I didn't hear that. You received what? We did receive um, building sections. Right. Yeah, just yeah. typically, I mean, the kind of the standard that, that's been set most recently is that we would see um, sections that would um, go through the, through the subject site and then into the adjacent sites um, and also ideally be showing sections through the um, adjacent building just to show the relationship of um, of the proposed, um, uh, you know, development in relation to the neighboring um, sites. Um, so I just I didn't I didn't really see that. So just that was a that was just a question. I wasn't sure if if there was some difference because I know that their application was deemed complete um, a long time ago. So I wasn't sure if that was like that what they got in prior to that um, being a requirement. So um, yeah. So that was it. That's um, we, we do ask for that with all of our projects that are coming in now because they're all subject to the new materials list, um, mm -hmm. but this one has to wait for some time. Okay. Thank you. Other commissioner questions? I have a few. I wanted to follow up on Commissioner Dawson's question regarding the documentation. If, did I understand it correctly is that since there's no density maximum for the district, if uh, if it stays under the if a project stays under the F FAR and meets the SEP, well, this one doesn't even meet the setback standards. But essentially, if they want, let's just say they wanted to have somewhat smaller units, the base density could be increased. It's, it was still a little unclear to me how you go from submitting a set of plans to de determining what the density level is. It's kind of like, it seems to be backwards. Usually you go from the density and then you see how can it be developed. Under our uh, rules, we seem to be going from, well, su submit us a set of plans and if they meet the uh, setback, massing, height, uh, requirements, then you can have as many units as you can fit into it. Is that, am I really understanding it or is it more complicated than that? Um, it, it's not, uh, it's not more complicated, but um, there are a few different ways that different jurisdictions are doing this in areas where there are no density requirements. Um, some jurisdictions um, apply the density bonus directly to the FAR. Um, we went with the way that other, some other jurisdictions are doing it where you um, have the applicant provide this base density plan set. Um, and after they provided this fully conforming building with the number of base units, um, we had that plan in their proposal reviewed by um, Goldfarb-Lippman attorneys to see if that would meet the test for the density bonus. 
And, um, and one of the reasons why it makes sense in this case is because their units that they're proposing in the density bonus project are uh, equal to or smaller than the average size of the units in the base density project. So they uh, weren't trying to game the system as you as you would think, like if, if you could provide as many units as you can in the base density project, then you would increase your density. But um, in this case, because, they're av because of the average unit comparison, um, we were confident that they were not doing that in this case. So, do I understand it correctly that if I, um, since the, the, the material provided includes the plans, um, I could look at the plans and from just looking at the plans, if I could figure them out, um, I would come to the same conclusion that 133 units was, uh, was consistent with uh, requirements. Uh, it's sort of like that's what it comes down to is that somehow having a design that shows it's consistent with other requirements and then um, the that then determines the density that's correct that's the that's the um, method that we're using to establish what the base density would be in an area where there is no density requirement so the height the far the step backs um, the number of stories that's allowed, um, the requirement for ground floor commercial, the parking requirements, um, all those things, the pedestrian passageways in this case, all those things are requirements in the downtown plan and they limit the area of the building that can be dedicated toward residential. Um, so when they provided a fully conforming plan set, we had an um, uh, demonst they've demonstrated how many units can be provided in that in a fully conforming building without any incentives, concessions, or waivers. So, am I understanding it correctly that, in a sense, the additional height is needed to provide space for the density bonus units? Is that kind of how, and the different waivers and concessions are all what's necessary? To make it uh, to to get that additional density going from 133 to 175, is that am I understanding that correctly? Um, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, another question has to do with the design, and I'm not sure I have uh, the the designs that I saw are the most uh, recent ones, but they showed murals on the sides of the building. Uh, are those still being shown? And I guess are they, uh, is the intention that the, that the buildings would have those murals or are they just for, um, you know, for discussion purposes? Um, the, the intent of the um, staff recommendation is to include, is to approve the building as it's shown on the plan. So yes, we would um, assume that the murals are part of the project if they're shown on the proposed plans. Um, but that's something we could add in as an additional condition of approval to make sure that that doesn't get left off of the final product. So as part of the design per permit, we're also approving the murals. If, if, yeah, it's shown on the, the plans as a part of the project, so that would be part of the approval process. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the uh, density bonus affordable units. I understand that they're proposing a certain number of very low and a certain number of low, but according to the density bonus law, um, is it what would be the, the the minimum requirement? As I understood it, they're getting a 35% density bonus, so 5% of the units have to be um, affordable, and as I calculated, it would be about 8.75 or 9. So it, am I correct that that would be the minimum uh, density bonus affordability requirement? Um, in order to be eligible for the number of incentives and concessions that they're requesting, um, they've provided the number of affordable units. I, I believe it's 11 percent. Uh, maybe I didn't, maybe I misheard your question, sorry. <laughs> 
what I'm trying, as I read the density bonus law and the city density bonus ordinance, to get 35% density bonus, there needs to be 5% very low income affordable units. And I understand that maybe to get waivers and other concessions, they're doing more. But in terms of just meeting the density bonus requirement, what they're required to provide is 8.75 very low income units. That's really my question. Um, unless somebody else knows that off the top of their head, I can, I can look at that up and find that out for you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Does the planning director want sure, to share? Sure. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute there. Um, I, I can jump in there. Uh, so the density bonus, if you provide 5% at very low, um, that, which is 50% of area median income, so 5% uh, of the units at very low income will get you a 20% density bonus. And then for each additional percent that you provide uh, in very low income units, you get an additional 2.5% uh, uh, density bonus. <laughs> And so what that does is if you actually provide 11% at very low, that gets you a 35% density bonus. So they're, um, they're proposing 11% at very low. Sam can give the specific numbers, but um, they're actually not proposing quite a 35% density bonus. I think they were proposing like a 33%. I, I, I'm going from memory here. Sam may know the exact number. So. So I think that they're actually providing slightly more than they would otherwise be required to um, to achieve the density bonus that they're requesting. But 11% um, at very low is the max that gets you um, the 35%. They would only have to get, uh, uh, if they're providing 5%, they would only be um, subject to a 20% density bonus allowance. Okay, so that 11% is taken from 170, the total number of units, the 175 units? It's not. That's taken from the base project, and that is that is consistent with state law. It requires that that uh, base project is where the 11% comes from. So our, our code reflects that as well because that's what the state law requires. So the 11%, um, the 11%, of the density bonus would be 20 units, right? 15 being uh, very low, five being low. And what, I've, uh, my understanding it correctly that those um, 20 units are the required density bonus, affordable density, number of affordable density uh, bonus units. A am I understanding that correctly? That in order to get the 35% density uh, bonus, they have to provide 11% uh, of the base density, which would be 20. Is that 20? What would it be? So it's, the 20 units is the um, inclusionary requirement for the pro for the 133 units, and then 11% would be 15 units, and that's what they're providing for the density bonus. And then they're still providing the remaining five. Um, inclusionary units, but that would be at the, the low income level of 80%. Okay, so the 11% um, required af affordable density bonus units equals tw uh, 15 units. And then the inclusionary would require 20, um, 20 units. And the, the staff recommendation is to uh, count the density bonus units as inclusionary units. Am I understanding it correctly? That's correct. Except I wouldn't call that a recommendation. That's actually a requirement of case law from the Latinos Unidos versus the County of Napa. And the, um, the uh, Planning Commission received, and it's posted online, an analysis from uh, several attorneys as well as some conclusions from staff that relate to that. So um, the uh, the, one of the attorneys that we consulted on this actually represented the County of Napa in the case, um, arguing that you could, in, a, in essence, stack the density bonus and inclusionary units. Um, but what the, the courts determined was that, no, you cannot do that. You have to um, layer, you, you can't layer those. You have to count them together. Well, at this point, I was just asking a question. Um, 
I'll have comments when it's time to provide comments. But um, I just really, it was, I, I guess I misunderstood what the law required in terms of the percentage of very low income units to get to 35%. So this has been helpful. Uh, will the affordable, do you know whether the affordable units will be rented or sold? Um, this is a condo project, so theoretically they would be sold, but is the intention of, do you know if the intention of the developer is to rent them? Maybe I can ask that if you don't know it. I'm, I, I believe the intention is to rent them, um, and I don't have the rental numbers off the top of my head, but I can look those up for you. Um, for the affordable units. Um, I also um, wanted to clarify for you, Chair Schiffer, that the um, the bonus that they're asking for is a 31.58% density bonus, not the full 35. Right. I, I think that's in the staff report. And Chair Schiffer, I do have that table um, open on my screen right now. Um, if, it, if you think it would benefit you or other members of the commission or the community, I'm happy to walk you through that uh, that table quickly. I think I understood your response. I'm, okay, fair enough. Go through that. Okay. Um, I think that concludes my questions. Um, and I, if there are no more commissioner questions, Commissioner Nielsen. I just wanted to. Um, I unmuted. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, go back to the mural conversation just real quick. Um, I just want to clarify. I don't. My understanding is that um, we're not. We would not be approving these murals as they are shown necessarily. They're, we're just. We're just approving the idea that there would be murals on those walls. Um, it does say on the drawings that those are to be determined um, in terms of uh, the murals themselves. Um, so a question I do have um, about that, um, Samantha, is: Is there? Uh, is there any selection criteria in terms of the artists for those murals? They haven't proposed any criteria. Um, when we recently did the mural, the, the MA did the mural at Abbott Square, um, they had a whole process that they went through for selecting the artist. Um, we haven't heard that specific of a process yet for this, um, but mm -hmm. I, I think it would benefit um, the project to have a condition on there regarding the murals to ensure that those don't um, get pushed further back in the process. Right, maybe something, maybe it's something through the Arts Commission or something like that. Um, so, okay, thank you. Let me follow up on that, and then, uh, Commissioner Dawson. Does that mean that the city would have to approve the murals, or are we just? approving that there'd be murals and then they, the developer, as the conditions are now written, could put any murals that they want there? Um, I, we could craft a condition in the way that Commissioner uh, Nielsen suggested with the Parks Commission being involved and um, then they would be the um, approving body for the, those that, uh, pieces of art. So, but at this point, uh, the conditions don't require city approval of the murals. Um, the conditions don't. When when they're um, when we're approving a plan set, if there's a feature that's shown on the plan set and that plan set is approved, then that is um, part of the project. But um, a different elements that we want to make sure are included and. Um, uh, aren't left out of the building plan set. You know, we can um, we can strengthen that requirement with an, an additional condition of approval, um, and I think that that would um, definitely be helpful in this case. Okay, Commissioner Dawson, did you have a question or a question? Yeah, I just had one more question about the base density uh, and the the method that the city used to calculate this, because obviously this you know, uh, is the foundation in which the inclusionary and everything from there built out on. And so I just want to have a little more clarity around that. So I understand with the um, density bonus, there's the ability to ask for waivers and incentives. Um, and so 
where where is it required that when you're calculating base density um, that it just seems odd to me that you calculate base density in a fully compliant project and then we end up with a project that is outside of, of our of the basic standards. So where is it required in law or what is the guiding principle that requires the base density be, to be calculated the way that we've chosen to do it here? Um, I don't know the specific law, Lee. Do you have input on that? Sure, I can, I can speak to it. So um, the state law, the state density bonus law in and of itself specifies that cities must allow for the 35% increase in density. And so um, that's just, the, that's the basic premise of the, the state density bonus law. And so in order to provide that, um, that increase, there has to be an increase from something. You know, so um, as Sam was saying, you know, we could say, all right, from the uh, 5.0 uh, maximum FAR that's allowed, we could allow a 35% uh, increase in FAR. So an additional uh, you know, 1.75 uh, FAR. So it would allow to go up to 6.75 FAR. Um, that would be another way to allow for that. And some cities do that. Here we said, all right, what is your conforming project? And, and I think Sam did a good job of, of explaining sort of like the, of making sure that the, that the applicant isn't gaming the system. Um, and, and I'll explain that a little bit differently than she did, um, which is like if, it, you know, so uh, Commissioner, or excuse me, Chair Schifrin was saying, it was asking about sort of the square footages of the units and how many units they could get in there. And yes, they could come in and they could say, um, I can get, let's pull a number out, 300 units that conform to all of the, um, the step backs and step back requirements um, and put in, put in the uh, passageways. I've got 300 units, but those units might be only, let's say, uh, 500 square feet each. Where Sam's talking about gaming the system is you can't then come in and say, well, I, I want a 35% density bonus and I want to um, have, uh, so I get 400 units, we'll say, make it easy, 400 units instead of 300, but I want those units not to be 500 square feet, I want them to be 800 square feet. And so instead of that seven-story building, you now get a 12-story building because not only have you gotten the 35% increase, but you've also had an increase in the square footage of the unit. So it's important to tie that square footage, the, the square footage in the base project to the square footage in the, uh, the density bonus project. And so um, essentially when you're saying, you know, well, how can they go over and above and how can they go outside of that box? That's exactly what the state density bonus permits through the waivers. And it's hard to argue that, um, you know, someone can get, you know, if, if this were, let's say it were regulated by dwelling units per acre and they were only allowed to do 100 units, they could say, all right, I'm going to come in and do 100 units here. And um, with 130, we, we also wouldn't allow them to come in and say, like, all right, I'm going to do, I can do 100 units because we would have them do a base project for that as well. And if those 100 units were 500 square feet, then we wouldn't allow them to do 135 units at 1,000 square feet, because then you're actually not meeting the intent of that by increasing the, the square footage and, and going above and beyond what the, uh, the waivers, I think, are intended to allow, which is the waivers are intended to allow the 35% additional units. You've got to allow those 35% additional units if they're providing the affordable units. You just, it, it's not set up to say, all right, well, we're going to get substantially larger units. And that's where it's important that we, we took that, um, uh, that same square footage or lower in the density bonus project. So, I mean, that was a lot of info. Did that, did that help to answer the question? Yeah. Um, now, yeah, uh, <laughs> a 
what it says to me is that there sure is a lot of when you don't have a set density there's sure a lot of a negotiation that can go on in terms of what what works and what doesn't work and uh, how the whole system um, how those the that base density gets determined. I understand the, the factors that go into it and what the staff is looking for, but it's um, not uh, particularly transparent to the public. Yeah, and, and you're right. They could, they could have come in with 300 units um, if they were really small. And they just, then the, the density bonus project would have had to keep those small units. And so they have to look at what they, they want from a market perspective and then they can't, they can't game the system by going much larger than what they propose in the base. So there's this relationship between the base project and the number of units that they propose and the, the size with the, with the proposed project, if it's a density bonus. Well, it sounds like there are two separate projects. There's the base project and then there's a density bonus project and there's a need for them to be consistent, but there, yes. all the calculations for them are done separately. Yeah, they're tied, they're tied together, but yes. In fact, this project, and Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, this project initially came in without a density bonus, and um, their original proposal didn't include that at all, correct? That's correct. Yeah, so they, were, they, they came in and they submitted a project that didn't include the density bonus, and that was conforming, and they later changed to a density bonus uh, proposal. Did they come in with the same base density originally? It was roundabouts. It was 135 or so units, is, is my recollection. It was 135. Any other questions from commissioners? Why don't I open the public hearing? Uh, we can hear from the applicant first, um, and then we'll hear from the public. Assuming that the applicant wants to make the presentation. Yeah. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for your work tonight. I appreciate it. I want to really thank Sam and Samantha for her hard, hard work in really difficult circumstances. I mean, including a forest fire and the COVID lockdown and being evacuated with her family from their home to a sailboat, she somehow managed to get the staff report out. And, and it's really an excellent staff report. I, those of you who have read it, I, I hope you've, it's a, there's a lot of work in it and there's a lot of details and there's a lot of history here and she really put it together. So uh, a thousand thank you, Samantha, I wanted to say that. I also thought it would be helpful to provide a brief history of how this important project came to this point. And I think for those of you who are new to community might not know this history, it's important. I think it's interesting. So in the late 1950s, after a major flood, uh, at 55, the first levee system was constructed along the lower reaches of the San Lorenzo River. That protected the downtown from flooding, but it also severed the connection between the downtown and the river. And so be, beginning in 1977, downtown plan, and every plan drafted since then, there's been a strong yearning that was expressed by the community to reestablish this connection to the river. That is to reestablish this long ago broken link and re reconnect downtown the community to the river once again. That's why this project is so important to the community. So that, this is what, what, what inspired our five-year quest to make this community aspiration a reality. In, 19, in 2015, responding to the fact that the then current downtown plan had not, over the intervening 65 years, created the framework to make this community shared vision a reality and updated plan was conceived. The community, the planning department, the economic development department, and your commission began the process to update the downtown plan to create the environment where this reconnection to the river could become real again. After more than 25 community meetings and finally unanimous approval by the California Coastal Commission, the new plan was adopted. This project is a direct result of those efforts and will finally result in beginning that renewed community connection to the river that's so important. And I know you've seen some of the plans 
but I don't think you fully grasp uh, if you haven't really given it some thought. This is an area uh, three times the size of Abbott Square overlooking the river and a new uh, experience that will really, at, at the end of Cathcart Street, will connect downtown once again finally to the river. It's so critical to this community and coming out of this, this, this um, really terrible situation that we have we begin a new chapter in downtown to, to really save downtown. I can't say it any more uh, strongly. Um, we've got to create a new environment that tells a new story and reconnects downtown. I want to um, talk a little bit about affordability and, and these 15 very low units. Down, as, as, you, as you may know, uh, there's Vena standards that the city has to create a, uh, a certain number of very low income units. Uh, the current RENA cycle requires 180 very low income units. So far we've created zero. This project along with others are creating the, a really meaningful amount of units. 15 units plus the 15 of five affordable uh, are as big as some standalone affordable units with no city subsidies, we're creating these units. So I wanna just make those points. And I wanna also clarify something on the affordability, on the uh, murals. We, I think Commissioner Nielsen's uh, uh, approach makes a lot of sense. Our vision, we, we show the murals on the, on the, on the building because we don't wanna see long periods of blank walls. We think it's an opportunity, like at the uh, Museum of Art and History to do something interesting. And we do think there's an opportunity for a community process to establish uh, uh, murals there. Um, now, it may be that these murals don't last very long if another building is built adjacent uh, in the near future because that, all the, that land is current zoning. But I think it would be a great community um, opportunity for the Arts Commission and the community to look at ways we can uh, create some great uh, community murals and kind of extend the concept that's been started at the, at, at the Museum of Art and History, expand it down Front Street to this site. So with that, I wanted to let you know, we've got our design team is available to answer questions, both landscape and architecture. Uh, Doug Ross is here, my partner on the project to answer any questions you might have on construction technology or any other aspects of the project. And, and anyway, with that, we're here to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just now open it up for any public testimony. If there's anybody in the, uh, on the call who would like to uh, testify on this project. Chair Schifrin, um, for the members of the public, if you look, if you're watching on community television, you'll see instructions to press star nine to raise your hand. Anyone on the line, please do that now and we'll work our way down the queue. Again, if you're calling in, press star nine. Your hand will be raised and we'll move down the line in order. Please do not wait until the last minute. Speaker, you're on the line. I think I'm off mute now. You can speak. You're on the line. Me? Okay. Um, my name is Alicia Sharon. I'm a, a county resident in Santa Cruz. And I want to reflect. I heard the applicant say that this project is really there to help save downtown, to help reconnect downtown with the river and to revitalize it in a way. And I want to speak that. You can't save downtown with also, without also considering saving the 418 project. The community gathering space that is in that building on 418 Front Street is an incredibly vital arts institution for this community in Santa Cruz and for downtown. I mean, it brings thousands of people into the area. It is an incredible public presence, and I can only imagine the kind of performance art, the kind of gatherings, the kind of magic that could happen if the 418 Project is able to still be a part of downtown, of a vital, revitalized downtown. And I want to speak to the mental health aspects that that community really helps to support for the people in our area. We're coming through 
not only a pandemic, not only civil unrest that's happening in our country, but now these massive wildfires that have moved through. And personally, as someone who consistently went to the 418 Project for movement practices, for dance, for community, to not have access to that space right now because of COVID is incredibly hard. You know, I'm also evacuated from my home. I'm displaced. Countless of my friends have lost their homes. And this is where we would go to grieve, to gather, to dance, to create. And that space is so important to thousands and thousands of residents in Santa Cruz. And I just want to put those words in to please any way that it can be part of this development, keep it part of this development. Thank you. Thank you. The other, other members of the public, yes, please try to keep it to about three, three minutes. Good evening. My name is Henry Hooker. I live in Santa Cruz and I represent Santa Cruz Seniors for Housing. We're all aware that there's a housing crisis in California. We also know that we have a housing crisis in the city of Santa Cruz. The only way to fix this housing crisis is to build more housing at all levels of affordability. To address the climate crisis at the same time, we need to focus building the housing in cities where there are jobs and schools and the possibility of replacing day-to-day -day use, car use, with walking, bikes, and public transit. One goal is to have adequate and affordable housing for people who work in Santa Cruz. The daily commute in and out of town on Highway 1 is a disaster for many, many reasons. Another is to believe that your children and my children will be able to afford to remain in Santa Cruz, should they desire to do so. Research shows that social equity is achievable and benefits everyone when neighborhoods are available to people of all income levels. Downtown offers a good place to get started. I urge you, the planning commissioners, to unanimously support this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker, you're on the line. Hello, this is Gabrielle Edelman, and I am the president of the board of directors of the 418 Project, one of the businesses that will be displaced by the construction and hope to be part of the new project. Um, we've been around downtown for over a quarter century, and we are so pleased to be able to serve the community, and we would like to be able to continue to serve the community, especially at this time when connection and, and support are so very important to the members of the community. So I urge you to make sure that we have a space in the new development. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, you're on the line. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Great. My name is Mark Masidi Miller, and I am a former planning commissioner for uh, two terms and was a member of the planning commission when the downtown plan update was carefully constructed. And I just have to tell you, this project checks a lot of boxes. Uh, it is uh, very consistent with the downtown plan first principles. And uh, number one, the update recognizes that taller buildings like this one will contribute greatly to the architectural fabric of the city and provide significant opportunities to plan for environmentally sound infill development. And we gotta pay attention to the environment. It provides housing. Uh, it provides significant new housing opportunities throughout uh, downtown and especially right along the San Lorenzo River front. Number three, it creates a strong network of public and private open spaces that will create a more socially active and pedestrian oriented downtown. Number four, it uh, meets a couple of the, checks a couple of the boxes on the San Lorenzo Slurp, the urban river plan. It will improve public access to and along the river. It will improve the urban and neighborhood interface with the San Lorenzo River. 
Number five, it also will uh, create significant new public space by filling adjacent to the river walk, providing direct physical access to the river walk and appropriate active commercial and residential uses along and adjacent to the river walk. Number six, it hits the housing blueprint, creating housing downtown. Uh, approval of this project will encourage construction of units with a uh, specific focus on enabling projects in the current development pipeline to break ground. Number seven, and maybe the most important thing, it creates much needed housing in our community. 175 residential housing units will be created. 15 of these units will be affordable to households making 50% of the AMI and five making 80% of AMI. That is a significant increase in much needed housing stock in our community. So I urge you to adopt the staff recommendation tonight and thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak on this item? Indeed. Speaker, you're on the line. Hello? Hello, go ahead. Hello, good evening. Chair, commissioners, and staff, my name is uh, Doug Cheshire. I'm a field representative with uh, Carpenters Local 505 here in Santa Cruz County. We've entered a time where uh, somewhat important decisions have become very important decisions. And in light of the decisions being made tonight, we'd like for you to weigh heavily on what this project brings to this community. The developer is asking for concessions on the part of the city. Looking at this project from the outside, it looks great, again, but what does it bring to this community? As housing prices and the cost of living have increased, coupled with a pandemic, city leaders are obligated to do what is in the best interest of their community. Projects deemed significant should be developed with significant benefits to the city and its residents. I believe that it would be a missed opportunity to move forward with such a project that does not, does not require any. The men, women, and minorities that work in the construction industry and that live right here in Santa Cruz need a job right here in Santa Cruz, livable wages, and a pathway to a career through a certified apprenticeship program and the benefits that ensure that their and their family's health are not in question are just a few of the small benefits that a project of this significance should bring to its community. So on behalf of over 500 members, I ask that you deny this application and the urge staff to come up with a development agreement that is in the best interest of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other speakers? You're on the line, speaker. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, this is Laura Bishop, and I'm the executive director of the 418 Project, and I'd just like to say hi to Chairman Schifrin, commissioners, and the honored staff and community. And I just want to acknowledge the environment where a developer can include a longstanding arts community in a development that's going to redefine Santa Cruz. I'd like to acknowledge the elements that have been accomplished in the conversations between us and the developer and some significant areas that we've, that we've accomplished. And I'd like to let you know that there is an LOI that exists between the 418 project and the developer and that there are some agreed upon areas which could be included in the staff report for this project. The 418 project is a significant public activator and we look forward to continuing to be able to be a positive and vibrant activator of downtown and the river. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you. Other speakers? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Arnott. Yes, yes. My, name is, my name is Dave Walter. We lost you. I think we lost him. I'll catch him if he calls back. Next speaker. Hi. Am I coming in okay? Yes. Um, this is Matthew Arujo. I'm a 
local resident in Santa Cruz and also um, your local bike guy. I work over on the east side at the Family Cycling Center. Um, and access by bicycle to downtown has always been something that's very important to me. Um, and the way that this development is coming along, I'm really optimistic that that will continue. And really what it comes down to is I moved to Santa Cruz for the sake of being closer to the 418 project. And I love getting from my side of town to the 418 project to dynamically move and share with my community and create something that really is, well, you can't really find it anywhere else. It's intangible um, and really something that you can't put a price tag on. Um, and by you ensuring that 418 has a future within this development, it really will help check those boxes of revitalizing downtown and making this uh, a greater asset to the community than just essentially a really tall building with lots of, uh, what was the hot ticket today? Um, density housing. Um, yeah, so really make sure that there's a home for the 418 and a place for people to move dynamically and dance and share and laugh and cry. Uh, I could go on, but I won't for the sake of time. I uh, really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share. Thank you very much. Other speakers. Hello, commissioners. Hi, uh, my name is Robert Singleton, and I'm a former planning commissioner. Um, and I'm speaking with you tonight because I really want you guys to approve this project. Um, back when we were considering the downtown, the downtown plan and its many iterations, this project meets all the goals that we were looking for. It helps us to revitalize a valuable public asset in the river. It creates a wonderful new public space. It meets all of our goals and then some in terms of affordable housing. Um, by utilizing the density bonus, it's going above and beyond what the normal requirements are for affordable housing to get the concessions. I personally live near the project. I have been looking forward to seeing this type of project come forward. I mean, this is exactly what we wanted. Um, in regards to what some other speakers have said uh, in terms of community benefits, this project would offer many, many community benefits. The revitalized public space for one, being able to uh, attract more attention and uh, more active uses and recreational uses on a river, active transportation, more active commercial uses, those all benefit everyone who lives and works in downtown. Um, I just, I, I don't know why we would, we would second guess this project because it's the exact thing that we were looking for and the exact type of project we had in mind when we approved the downtown plan. So again, I would just encourage you, please move forward. Please be thorough. I, mean, I just appreciate all of your time tonight and all the work you do for our community. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Hi, my name. Yeah, my name is Dave Walter. I'm a member of the community, the Santa Cruz community, and I'd just like to. Um, support the 418 and 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 you know I heard earlier about revitalizing and bringing a new day to the downtown community and making it up to the river and that's really great but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater and the baby in this case would be the 40, the 418 project uh, it is as vital whoops like we lost them can you unmute yourself, Walker? I'm back. Hello. Okay, yes, great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'd just like to support um, the project, but I think it needs to include the 418 um, along with it. 
um, um, this not only is a community thing, but it's also a tax base thing. All those people that go to the 418, after they do their dance, they go to the restaurants. They uh, buy things in the shops. Um, and uh, it's just something you really don't want to lose. Um, you'll lose the flavor. You'll lose the, the ambiance of the city. So, and that's, that's really all I had to say. And, and I actually would be remiss without saying thank you guys for putting the time in to do this. Um, and let's, let's get this done in a, a way that benefits all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I'm great. Good evening, uh, planning commissioners and chair. My name is Jesse Bursto with Swanson Builders. I'm a development project manager, and I uh, just wanted to speak in favor of this project. As um, previous uh, speakers have said, it, you know, it really does check all the boxes for the vision of the downtown plan and the riverfront activation. And, you know, along with the community benefits and, and bringing people to the levee and, you know, really uh, activating that whole side of downtown. It's also adding 20 units to, to the affordable inventory that we don't have right now. And it's something we really need. We need all types of housing and uh, it's a very exciting project. So we just uh, want to uh, ask the planning commission to, to make their recommendation in favor of this project. City Council, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. Um, as a resident, a renter, and a neighbor, someone who lives about a five-minute walk from the project, I just wanted to quickly voice my support. Um, I'm excited to see more opportunities in Santa Cruz. And um, I would like to echo the others who have uh, voiced their desire to see the 418 project included in this development. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello, commissioners and community members. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, uh, my name is Megan. I've been living in Santa Cruz for about 25 years and um, have been a member of the 418 Project for the last 20 years, paying for classes, doing my shopping before and after classes. And I want to echo what I've heard other 418 members saying. Um, on this call tonight that we want to support this project and we want to make sure that this project preserves and does not displace this local nonprofit which has been part of the heart of Santa Cruz for over 25 years and is where I met my husband, where I bring my child, um, where so many people make connections and keep the, the, the love of Santa Cruz alive. and. Um, I want to appreciate everyone. I know there's been communication with uh, Laura Bishop from the 418 and the developers to find a way to allow the 418 to be part of this project. Um, um, so just thank you so much, and that's my request, and I know many of us feel the same way. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, this is Kyle Kelly. Uh, I'm speaking in strong favor of the project. Um, this is including 15 very low income units that are really hard for us to get out of a lot of these developers. Uh, I mean, that it alone for arena allocation uh, ends up taking up 10% of, of the goal that we need. Um, and additionally, there's another five units that are, that are low income units. Um, I, I, it's just, it's great to see projects like these coming up um, and still coming up even during a pandemic uh, and a recession. Um, 
reason for the 418 project, I'm, I'm really glad that we can try to preserve a, a cultural and art institution within the city. Um, it also provides event space uh, that people can uh, people can rent. I, I really hope that becomes part of the project as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, am I on the line? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, my name is Candace Brown, and um, I have uh, four key points. Um, first of all, um, I really like the design additions, and I wanted to make sure it wasn't clear from the picture, which is very hard to see on the screen, where that carries up throughout the building. So it would be nice to see um, some uniformity carry throughout. Um, the affordable housing obviously is a key issue here. And 15, as the previous speaker said, is about 10%. There's about 156 that are still in deficit on the, the regional housing needs allocation. But when you have so much market rate housing, it also increases the AMI tables every six months to a year. And I think I would suggest that you add to the Planning Commission agenda um, to consider that these AMI tables are being affected by all this market rate housing. The Riverwalk is seeing 10% increases per year in the last two or three years each year, and those are affordable units. The uh, community space, I think, is vital for 25 years. An LOI is not necessarily a contract, and it's not necessarily transferable if there's change of ownership. So I think it would be important to make sure that that was locked in stone, because in the 100 Laurel Street, there was a transfer of ownership and a different developer doing the project. So it's not sure that they are fully protected. Um, and uh, finally, the EIR, the shadowing on the river was a very important part of it. And I'm feeling very uncomfortable that the density bonus allows this height increase, which is, of course, allowable by state law. But is that considered in the EIR itself and the effects on the river? And so hopefully the uh, commission can consider that. Um, and finally, I would ask that the commission consider asking for residential properties to have Leases that are more than 30 days, we're seeing at uh, 630 Water and at 555 Pacific, 30-day um, leases, which are very expensive. They tout them as luxury living, and this is not affordable in Santa Cruz and will not address the housing crisis that we have and allow for a live and work environment. So unless you guarantee that these are long-term residents of at least six months to 12 months, it will not solve our housing crisis. So if those conditions are not met, I would suggest that you deny the project until these issues are worked out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Go ahead. Yes. So every local and state official that represents me from the city of San Cruz Council to Gavin Newsom, the governor, has publicly supported creating affordable housing to address our state's homelessness crisis. When I hear that the Planning and Development uh, Commission is planning to authorize the construction of 175 new living units, I think this is what I voted for. I love history, but what is a building compared to a human being sleeping in a bed at night? I love trees, but are we going to allow three trees to be put above the needs basic needs of human beings. As to environmental concerns, I would note that the elevators for these high buildings are an extremely efficient energy use of transportation compared to the alternative of having people drive to downtown Santa Cruz from single family units. The Santa Cruz Watsonville metropolitan area is the third most expensive metropolitan area in the country. Yet when I walk around the city, I don't see great gaps be like opulence. I see normal homes that are priced like luxury housing. The city has for years artificially inflated property values to and failed to allow for the new buildings to meet demand. It is morally unacceptable to have people living on the streets. It would be considered a violation of the Fifth Amendment to punish the most heinous criminals by forcing them to sleep under overpasses. The city has a moral obligation to address the urgent crisis of homelessness. 
This is not the time to stand on ceremony, demand perfect solutions. The proposed development would not solve the homelessness crisis, but over 100 new places to live would exist in the world that did not exist now. I call on the Commission to fulfill their pledges and approve the development. Thank you. Nick, speaker, please. And if, if you're willing, please give your name. I've asked them to unmute. Speaker, you're on the line. Go ahead. Can you hear me? No, well, I can now. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Maggie McGuire, and um, I love the 4A team. And I believe it's significant to say that the 4A team project is a community staple, and we have been around for over 25 years. It is a representative of the Santa Cruz culture, and it creates a safe space for people of all accessibility levels to perform, engage, and witness local art. Um, how I see the riverfront project right now is that it doesn't really have the community or people that need um, accessibility, especially with different income levels. Right now, I feel like it has like Silicon Valley in mind. So to put the 418 or to give it a place within the project would really benefit the Santa Cruz community and it will give a place for the arts and show that you're a part of the community and it won't displace the arts. So I just want to recognize that the 418 is the heart of Santa Cruz and it needs a place to be. So thank you. Thank you. Chair, there are no further speakers that have indicated they wish to testify. Uh, ah. the, give the applicant a chance to rebut or respond. Uh, I'd like uh, to recognize have uh, Doug Ross, uh, my partner, uh, discuss our own, our discussions with 418. We're we're working to to make that happen, and and he's taking the lead on that. And I, I thought you, you might want to say a few words on that to address that. Thank you, uh, Owen. I'm not sure if I'm on or not. You're on. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, Doug Ross, Owen's partner, and I just wanted to mention that we've been working closely with the 418 for over 14 months to uh, assure them a new future home here. The COVID impact has uh, slowed things down a bit, but we're, we've made significant progress and we fully expect to have their presence back in the building because we value all their contributions to the community. Okay, do any commissioners have questions um, for the developer or for the applicant. Seeing no other um, public comment, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring the matter back to the commission for discussion and action. Um, who would like to go first? Commissioner Conway, I start at my upper left. You're on mute. There we go. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Glad to. Good evening. Thanks, Chair Schiffman. Um, so first of all, um, I would really like to thank um, the parties who have been working so hard on this. I know that the applicants have been working hard, but I major kudos to staff for pulling this complicated matter off during these weird times. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I do have a couple of comments. One of them is um, that I think that the, what happened with this project after it went to the, the Historic Resources Commission is a perfect example of how community participation really can make a project better. Um, I, I know I am with a lot of people. I, um, we know we need to change. 
Um, I like to change, um, and I'm sad to see the change. Um, and what happened at the commission uh, to um, preserve and honor the, some of the look and the feel um, of the buildings that are being lost um, is is really heartening and I think they're just better. It's a prettier building and a better building. And it's also exciting to think that 418 could be um, in a space that um, would would really help to continue to enliven that community reference. And it is an incredibly valuable project and I appreciate all the advocacy here. Um, another comment I'd, I'd like to make that I think this project is um, is really worth noting and pointing out, which is, and also thanking both the chair for asking the questions and staff for explaining it. Um, this is a real change in how we look at base density. And it's complicated. It's um, definitely not as straightforward to understand. But what I really like about it is it changes the longstanding dynamic that calls a unit a unit. Um, which, so in other words, a four bedroom, three bath home is a unit and a 500 square foot apartment is a unit. Um, and um, having that as our, the basis of our density calculation has resulted over many years um, in the real underproduction of the small units that we need so badly in the community. So yes, it's complicated. Um, I thought you did a great job explaining it, um, and it, it also explaining why this is the, the correct method. So um, I appreciate that. Um, I guess the other thing I'd like to say is that this is a catalyst project. It is exciting to finally see, after my 35 years in affordable housing development, one of our, one of our truisms was always, well, you can't make more land. And uh, in this case, we are making more land. And what we're making of this land is a connection between our town and our river, um, meeting a long goal, activating that river, making the river safer and healthier. The, um, we saw um, lots of studies of the shadows on the river make the fish and the birds healthier. I appreciate the really careful attention to um, the bird safe I don't know what the, what the words are of that, but I really appreciated that um, as well. Um, I have to say that um, the bike connection was um, something that is really important to me uh, and, um, and was throughout the whole process. I was at first kind of um, disappointed about the Elm Street um, connection um, because I was kind of counting on coming down there and, and uh, making my way home that way. Um, I know it's not gone. And um, I do think that the reasons for making that change um, make, make good sense. Um, I would like to say also something about um, the way the housing is provided. I understand why this project is mapped and going to be rented, but I do feel really strongly that what we really need are rental projects. I wish it was just a rental project. Um, because we need that type um, of project. And I have a long list of reasons from how well they're managed and how secure they are as rental projects. Um, like I said, I do understand the reason for doing it, um, but I thought that I would throw that out there. Um, so finally, um, there's, a, there's a lot of community benefits. They've been really well expressed by a lot of people. Um, but uh, the... Um, Oops, there we go. The um, having a, a selection process for the murals that would involve the community and have it be really spelled out. Um, I, I love that you want to do them. I agree with the blank space, and I think it would be um, a great way to have the community connect um, with the process. And um, I had one other thing, and I think I lost it when I got a phone call. Um, so thank you very much, and really thank you to everybody. Uh, Commissioner Nielsen, do you have comments on the project you'd like to make? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I would also like to thank staff um, for putting together a very thorough uh, report. It's a you know very complex um, project, but I felt like it was um, it was written 
and put together in a way that was um, that was easily understandable for me. <laughs> so thank you. Um, the, to me, um, this project is a landmark project for Santa Cruz. Um, we've there's been a lot of, or for a long time, there's been talk about uh, the city reversing its kind of literal view of the river, um, and you know, from a built um, perspective. You know, turning itself back to the river, uh, engaging with the river, no longer turning its back on the river. Um, so, uh, to me, I feel like this is a very uh, important project, um, and I think it's a great first step in linking um, the the city back to uh, back to its heart, which is the river. Um, additionally, this project creates density where it belongs uh, downtown, uh, adjacent um, to public transit. Um, and it's a mixed use development that provides much needed housing with commercial space along the river, creating an engaging location for people to gather, uh, and enjoy the river, uh, along the river walk. Um, and it's adding much needed affordable units, um, as we've heard, um, from many speakers tonight. Um, there's, so a few of the things, um, so those are all the, the I mean, those, those are the great things, right? So there's a few things that, I, that I'd like to bring up in terms of uh, from a design standpoint um, that I would like to be, I would like to be looked at um, a little bit further. I mean, I understand the, um, the reasoning and the, and the uh, exception for, uh, for not having to meet the, the skyline um, requirement. Um, but I think, I don't think it's. I don't think the buildings, uh, in terms of their mapping, are are as successful as they could be. I think um, the intention of the uh, of that skyline um, uh, of creating that skyline mapping of the roofs um, is because uh, we have we have buildings that are set on the river and they're they're going to be very long distance views um, from across the river. Um, and these are big buildings. And so um, I think the, um, the building to the south, um, the southern building, is probably the most successful in articulating its roof um, mapping and, and trying to make some variation there, um, which what I think, I think um, would help with, the, with that skyline variation. Um, and I think, and I would, um, I would like to see the, um, the developer and architect um, work um, on that with the, uh, with the other two buildings as well. Um, uh, I think also uh, specifically in terms of massing, um, the middle building, which is the, the large stucco, um, has a large stucco facade, um, on the river levee. I, I think that that could be, um, articulated a little bit better and, and broken up, um, maybe with some different materiality. Um, or color or something, but I, I, I just, um, I think it's, I think it's a bit large, um, as it is, is just one, um, as one mass. I think there's, but I think it could be handled. The height is fine with me, but I think the mapping could be handled, um, in a different way on that. Um, I'd like to understand and see a little bit better how the, how those historic facades, um, actually integrate into the building. Um, I mean, we did see that rendering, um, although it, it, it was very um, kind of a detailed view, a tight view, didn't really show us the entire um, facade. I know Samantha showed it to us, um, but I think it was only, she did show one, one view, um, but I think it was, I don't think it was on both uh, historic um, options. Um, so I'd like to see would be, I mean, I would prefer to see that, to, see, to understand how that's all going to integrate um, a little bit better or see how it would work. Um, I noticed um, on, uh, one, on the, one of the call-outs uh, for the materials board, uh, it does state white vinyl windows, or I think it was vinyl, but it does state white windows, and um, these renderings that we look at um, don't appear to have white windows. So I think that should be updated. I think the, 
I'm not I'm not necessarily I'm not in favor of the white windows. Um, I think the the way that the renderings look are better. Uh, maybe the white windows would be appropriate in the white stucco building, but um, I don't think they would work well uh, where we have the other materials. So I think that should be updated. Um, I was wondering about this bike connection, um, and because um, that came—I mean, that was something I read about. And um, also, um, when Samantha uh, showed us the extension of Elm Street, it that extension actually comes in right at almost at the southern property edge of um, of this project. So it, it makes me wonder if. You know, as future development does happen um, in the in the next parcel over, um, and I know that this building is set back. I don't know how many feet it's set back, but it's set back a certain distance, maybe 10 feet um, from that property line. That maybe there could be an easement that's put in on that southern property um, along that southern property line that would allow for um, actual bike access. We uh, it would not meet. It wouldn't meet. Um, accessibility requirements because it would have to be much longer and to actually make that work. But maybe for a bike, you know, a 10% grade is acceptable. I'm not sure exactly what that grade would need to be to, to get up. I think it's about 11 feet from roughly um, from levee to street, but uh, maybe there's a way to, to handle that um, in the future because um, I know that was something of a concern um, for some residents. Um, and then I think in terms of the um, in terms of the murals, uh, I, I love I love the idea um, of the murals. I think it's uh, it's incredible. And um, looking at the when, when you look at the success of of what happened at Abbott Square um, with those murals, um, it really shows that um, it makes a big difference when you're able to to do something to those blank walls. Um, and so I think it, you know, I think in this case, I think it would be, I think we should create a condition um, that um, in some way it's, you know, uh, the, um, the selection of the artist is administered through the Arts Commission, the Santa Cruz City Arts Commission, um, or, or something similar to that. Um, and that's. That's pretty much all I have. So again, I just would like to thank I would like to thank the applicant um, for putting together um, a great project, uh, a very well thought out um, project um, that really hit hit a lot of the marks of what we've been um, discussing within our city for many many years. Um, and I'd like to thank staff for um, for bringing it forward in in a um, very articulate way. So thank you. Thank you. Um, because you raised a number of issues around design and other factors, I wonder if it would make sense to have, uh, uh, give the staff a chance to respond to some of the concerns sure. that you raised. Hi, thank you, Chair Schifrin. Um We do have a condition of approval 32D um, that uh, requires them to um, pull some um, of the elements from the historic buildings up through the building. I've um, I've tried to zoom in on the buildings a little um, if you wanted to review those renderings again, but at a little bit of a closer okay. view. Do you want to see those? Sure. Yeah, we can look okay. at those. Ah. Okay, so this is this is blurry, but it's the um, mm -hmm. this is the 14 building there. Um, so the it's just the historic uh, elements of the historic facade, but no changes on the rest of the building. Um, and then the other one is somewhere. Here it is. Um, this is the 428 Front Street, and um, if you look in the left corner here, that's the mm -hmm. building. 
Um, um, so, so, Samantha, I just have a question. So, in terms of um, the impl implementation of these um, of these historic facades into the building, uh, what was the how did the how did the um, historic commission condition that, uh, and was it to be reviewed um, by by someone else within staff or uh, by a consultant, a con like a historic consultant? They didn't include that as part of their motion. Um, their motion was just to um, have the historic buildings replicated onto this new building. So um, there were there were no details um, that I recall um, for reviewing it. Okay. Um, I mean, I see. Yeah, I see that they've they've worked they've worked towards um, getting those getting them implemented into the design. I, you know, for me, I'm not um, I'm not an expert within, you know, historic structures or within, you know, uh, historic preservation. Um, so I, I don't think I could really speak to that. I just, um, so if the historic commission was fine with their, with how they were moving forward with it, then, then I'm fine with that um, as well. Um, so just to clarify, the Historic Commission did not see these rendering. Um, these were put together after the meeting. Right, I understand. I understand. Um, so then, um, can we, okay, so can we talk about the, the skyline um, um, piece then a little bit? I mean, maybe it might make. I guess it might make sense if the is 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 uh, is the architect on, or is it just Owen? See here. Owen, is the architect available? Adam, I'll it should be. I believe uh, Adam and Ian. I if they're, they're having, you know. Uh, you know there Ian there. Ian, it looks like Ian raised his hand. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hey, hi everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ian Murphy. I'm a principal with BDE Architecture, the architect for the project. Um, just really quickly, just so you guys have some context about uh, BDE's involvement. There have been a, uh, a lot of people who have really made this project what it is today. It's been in the works for a couple of years. Uh, BDE is the most recent addition to the project. We've been brought on to make sure that this project can really come to fruition in a realistic manner. Um, we're, we're based in the Bay Area. We're an 80-person firm. About 95% of our work is multifamily oriented. So this is really our primary focus. Um, you know, uh, with that out of the way, uh, to speak to the, the skyline, um, we thought this project did a pretty good job of articulating up and down and a really good job of stepping in and out and reducing massing. And we're pretty happy with that. But I think that there are elements that could be pretty easily adjusted, especially in the center building um, that, that could be modified to, to add a little bit more uh, expression. Um, I, I'm really curious uh, what the commission sees as being uh, the most successful part of the, the building that was called out. I think that one thing that we, uh, that the whole team tried to embrace with the roof line is the use of the roof decks to step the massing back. And so there's a, a great um, reduction in overall floor plate yeah. at the riverfront side of the buildings um, in order to kind of uh, make a little bit more visual interest. But um, yeah, if, if the commissioner doesn't mind speaking a little bit more about um, what is working on the, the building that was called out. Yeah, I, I'll, 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 con I'll uh, continue. Um, the, uh, I, I think the, I agree with you um, about the in and out, um, uh, the stepping in and out that you've, that, that the, that's been achieved with the building. I think that is very successful. I think the, the and also at the roof decks, um, I think that works really well. Uh, I think the um, the thing that um, I think for me that that stands out is the um, is, is that horizontal 
um, line that happens across the top. Um, that you, if you look at the, uh, it, in terms, of, I don't know if you can see the screen that I'm looking at right now, that Samantha put up. But the building, the south building has um, has these shed roofs that um, that kind of create this, you know, somewhat dynamic um, kind of feeling around the the roof line. I'm not suggesting that that you would do that throughout the entire project. I'm just showing that I'm just bringing that up as an example of what I think is being is successful on the on the southern building. Um, so, I mean, it does. I mean, I do see that it does step down a little bit, and you know, it, in those uh, you know where those three uh, masses pop up um, on this middle middle building, and maybe it's just that maybe maybe the maybe the thing is just that the entire thing. Um, is is the is the white stucco um, where it just feels like it could be broken up a little bit more um, beyond just the in and out. Um, and then speaking to the um, the building on the right, um, that one is is certainly more, much more blocky um, than the others. Again, these are all meant to be designed. Um, uh, to be different types of buildings and to, to appear to be different buildings. And so I do appreciate that. Um, I, I think I'm just um, responding more to kind of trying to break up that hor that that single horizontal line that goes across the top um, on some of these buildings. So that that's really that's the main that's the main thing I'm trying to achieve here with my comments. Did the architect want to respond to that, or where are we? Sure. Thank you for for clarifying. Yeah, I I think that you know, in essence, each building is responding to the the kind of architectural style that was that was picked for to make them individual. But um, uh, I think that there's you know some some work that could be done on the center building to incorporate sort of other. Uh, not the shed roofs, but appropriate roof stylings um, to make it cut down on that horizontal look, or maybe even just paint color to really differentiate the topmost portion of the building and, and kind of make it feel separate in massing from the rest. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I think that's fine. I, and, and, you know, uh, you know, this is obviously we're, we're in kind of a, Subjective area, um, and but but I will. I mean, I, I would just leave it to you and your firm. I mean, I know you're uh, well accomplished, and and you can, you know, you'll do a fine job. I just, um, if you, just with those comments, if you could just look at that in a little bit more detail, and and just um, do your best with making refinements as as you see fit. Definitely. Um, since you're on, can I just can we can we just um, discuss the the window um, the window selection um, because I I just want to maybe 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 there was there was a misunderstanding on what I was reading but um, it does show uh, on the materials board um, white vinyl windows um, I'm just getting to that sheet here. It, it appears that it's white vinyl windows called throughout the entire project. Is that um, is that what was intended? Yeah, that, thank you for pointing that out. Um, we had shown in many of the renderings that the center building was actually going to utilize uh, more of a custom uh, color. I think that primarily the project wants to, to use uh, a white window, but we we did have instances that are much more obvious in the in the blown up renderings and the blown up images of where we would like to deviate from that somewhat. And I think it's appropriate too that each building, um, you know, may utilize a, a different color to help distinguish it. Yeah, I mean, I just in in again in looking at the renderings that, that are up on the screen right now, um, the windows that are <clears throat> like in the southern building do not at all appear in the rendering to be white and um, and th these are the windows that you know have different types of siding um, that are not against the white stucco and um, and I think that the, from my opinion that I think white vinyl windows within those areas um, would not be the right choice um, so I would just ask that you guys just 
take a look at that and and you know just just think through what those wind what the what those color selections should be. Yeah, it's absolutely worth clarifying. Completely agree. Okay, thank you. Um, that pretty yeah. So that that um, that pretty much. It's, and then you're are you guys handling? Since I have you on, you guys are handling the um, the historic facade treatment um, on uh, along Front Street. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, it was a really interesting meeting. Um, there were a lot of ideas pitched around about the best way to deal with with those buildings, and the most realistic way to deal with that was to kind of take that same scale of the one-story buildings at 418 and 428. And, and replicate it in a way that made sense for, for the architecture of these structures. And so they really take up that that activated street frontage and they mm -hmm. do it in a way that works with the layout that, you know, cutting and pasting the existing buildings probably couldn't ever, ever really do. Right, right, right. Okay, well, I, I'm excited to see how that um, all comes together. So thank you very much. Um, you also asked a question about a bike access on the southern, on a possibility of a southern easement. I wonder if the planner can respond to that. Sure. Did we lose? Oh, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Um, I'm sorry, was your question if they could provide an easement um, at the Elm Street Passageway for bike access? Well, I'm just wondering, like, as a as a concept, um, I think it was kind of, I don't, I don't know if it really bears anything for this particular application, but, um, but looking, when I look at the facade, the, uh, the southern facade of that southern building, it's, you know, it doesn't seem to me that um, I mean, there's some windows on the upper stories, but uh, it seems that there would be the ability to maybe get some sort of ramp to work uh, that goes from Front Street up to the levee. Um, and it, but I don't know exactly what the setback is. It's not actually, it's not very, it doesn't look like there's very much of a setback there. So I don't know if that would, maybe that's something that would possibly happen. Um, more having to do with another project being developed south of this, where maybe that becomes part of that project. Um, because it does, I mean, when you drew that dashed line in the beginning of your staff presentation, it ends up really close to the edge of the, to the edge of the southern part of that building. So at, at, when Elm Street does get extended uh, in the future, it, it will pretty much be right there. And it, maybe that's the right location to have um, bike access. Is there any staff response to that? Um, I well, I I agree. There there's not room for um, access there now because there's no there's not really any setback on that side. Um, but it's certainly something that we can keep in mind as the side of Front Street is being developed, um, and particularly in that location that you pointed out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dawson, would you like to go next? Comments? Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, so I would like to echo uh, everybody's comments to staff. Thank you so much for the uh, very thorough uh, report. It is a complex project and um, your work is very much appreciated and helps us get through all of this. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I uh, really like about this project. Um, I really like uh, just as everyone has said, that this is really going to connect um, Santa Cruz to the river as a living ecosystem um, and not just a place where water goes through the middle of the city. So I think that's a very exciting element in this project. Um, I also uh, really want to um, commend the developer and the staff in working through um, the part of connecting uh, residents to the metro through metro passes and, and really making good on our promises uh, to make progress in uh, reducing our carbon um, emissions and um, finding alternate modes of transportation and making that accessible to folks. So I think that is a great element of the project as well. Um, 
I did want to uh, move through a couple of other uh, points. I wanted to second um, or maybe third or fourth uh, Commissioner Nielsen's um, condition um, about the murals to, to have that um, condition in the project that the Arts Commission, the City Arts Commission should be part of developing a process um, to get the community to be involved in appro approving those murals. So um, we can talk about that in detail later, maybe. Um, I also want to bring up a concern around uh, the, the bikeable connection and just state pretty clearly as um, bike is my primary mode of transportation in the city, um, where there are rails, I avoid and go somewhere else. It, it really breaks up the ability to connect um, your transit when there is a, a rail. Um, uh, Bike Santa Cruz County did provide some examples um, of a way to possibly make a ramp work. Um, if I'm remembering in the plans, it's, it's the Cathcart, um, kind of the grand stairway is about 60 feet wide. So there may be a way to kind of sweep um, you know, stairs up one side and uh, a bikeable ramp up the other. So I, I really would like to see um, the developer uh, take that into consideration um, and, and possibly have that condition moving forward. Um, having continuing to drive people to this new development and, and drive people through this area, um, I think would just help integrate it into the community and having a bikeable way through there, I think is important. So um, that's also something I'd like to consider. Um, and kind of the last thing I'd like to say is around the, the, the base density. I'm, I'm very clear about the density bonus law that, that, and how it is applied to this project. But around base density, um, it is complex, but I, I think we just need to be very honest about, you know, the number that is calculated for this ba that base density directly impacts how many affordable units are going to be available in the development. So these things are all connected. It is very complex. And I'd like to, you know, as much as we can get more clarity on, on how we're balancing square footage, number of units, as we're moving into these projects that are likely, you know, a lot of projects coming to us are going to be taking advantage of this density bonus law. And so understanding how that affects the affordable units available. This is 175 units and it's great that we're getting 20 affordable units out of it, but we also have to be realistic that we have huge needs around affordable housing. Um, and I would also just like to put on the record that I've had several constituents contact me and say that we have a lot of vacancy in market rate units downtown. So we need to always keep in mind and always make a priority and push as hard as we can within the boundaries of laws that exist for affordable housing. Um, and I think um, in the interest of time, I will leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Greenberg. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Hi. Okay. It's the two, the two buttons. So thanks uh, to all of you. Um, I also want to echo the thanks to the staff for the amazing amount of work under very challenging circumstances um, of putting this report together. Um, and also to echo, um, you know, excitement that, um, that density is being, is being brought, more density is being brought to downtown along with really important corridor for transit um, and the importance of infill development, the importance of a mixture of housing types, uh, and certainly the importance of renewed access to the riverfront. Um, I hear what Commissioner Dawson is saying about the importance of um, as much as possible enabling bike commuters to uh, to make use of that, um, as well as pedestrians. Uh, and so would be interested to hear more discussion about potential design solutions around that um, and the potential for, for ramps, if, if that's conceivable. Um, I really appreciated all the advocacy around the 418 project. Um, 
and would uh, echo the significance of that kind of longstanding cultural institution being maintained and enabling that to attract uh, community to that area, in all, you know, and to have this more um, vibrant ecosystem of cultural institutions um, and commercial spaces, similar to what is happening, I think, really at the Ma and Abbott Square. Um, so for all of these reasons, um, I think there is great potential. Um, I heard the comment from um, the, the public that if, you know, I, I'm not sure what, how strong the LOI is and, you know, what kinds of issues surround that and would be interested to hear more about how we can ensure that 418 has longevity in this space. Um, I, uh, I hear what Commissioner Conway is saying about the importance of rental housing um, and that to the degree possible um, would, would echo that um, endorsement for, um, for rental housing. Um, in terms of the affordability question, um, I would echo uh, Commissioner Dawson as well in saying that, um, you know, it's, there are likely to be a number of developments coming um, to us that combine, that, that make use of density bonuses, and to be aware that there are potential negative consequences of having a kind of glut of market rate housing in the downtown area, and to be aware that similar kinds of projects um, statewide, nationally, and so forth, that are downtown uh, transit-oriented development projects with predominantly market rate housing can have other kinds of effects, can have effects in terms of gentrification and displacement, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to um, increase the, uh, the inclusionary ordinance to 20%. Um, and this one obviously comes in prior to that, um, but by combining with uh, the density bonus and bringing that amount to 11% means that, you know, close to 90% of the, of the units will be uh, market rate and, and unaffordable to, to many, if not most, people uh, in Santa Cruz. And so I, um, I want to really endorse any, any possible ways of addressing uh, this issue and to explore, uh, if we can, further this precedence of the Napa case um, and to consider similarities and differences between our, our situation in that case, as well as, um, you know, while potentially we can't, um, I say potentially require, there is the possibility that we could, uh, that we could seek to have a greater amount of affordability in this development um, and would be really interested in figuring out ways of exploring that, that possibility. Um, so uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it there and just say that I'm an enormous supporter of affordable density on transit corridors, and as much as we can uh, maximize that through this project, um, I really support that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Maxwell, did you have any comments, additional comments to make at this time? At this point, I just want, I'm really just going to echo pretty much everybody that's spoken before me. Uh, thank, thanks to the staff and the developers for putting this project together. Um, I really agree with almost everything that every commissioner has brought up. So for sake of time, um, I, the, the main points, um, I like the art commission being part of the murals, uh, Commissioner Nielsen's idea. Definitely the bike access is a big, um, I'd like to see ideas come forward on how we can connect that a little bit better than just the rail idea. Um, and then the main thing uh, also uh, echoing Commissioner Greenberg and just finding more ways to increase the affordable housing is really what we need here. Um, but I'd really like this project. I think it's, it's needed and look forward to seeing it come, come forward. And I also would love to see the 418 project continue in the space and know how important it is uh, just for our cultural, I know, health 
of our people and the community. So that's about it, just echoing everybody else's. Thank you. Thank you. I have a number of uh, comments and a couple of questions. On the 418 project, what um, discretion does the city have in terms of, if any, in terms of trying to support the inclusion of the 418 project in the, revi in the, in the new project? I guess I'm asking the uh, planner or the planning director. Um, well, I can I can respond with saying that um, we um, we included the permit for the use. So um, the permit uh, the the use requires a permit to be on the ground level in that part of the downtown area. So while we couldn't require the developer to pick that tenant, um, we did include the permit for the use so that um, if they agreed to um, lease to that tenant, they would not have to come in and pay for that permit on their own. So I just want to be clear, given all the testimony that we heard, that the commission really does not have the authority and the city council doesn't have the authority to require the developer to uh, provide space for the 418 project. I understand they're negotiating in good faith, but I just want to be clear that it's not something that we could condition this project to do. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's thank correct. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to uh, thank staff and uh, uh, particularly for the staff report on a very complex, not only a complex project, but a very complex regulatory context. And um, I think it's, uh, it was a yeoman's task to try to make it understandable, and I appreciate the work that, that the staff did. I also want to thank all the people who testified um, during the public, um, public portion. I, finally, a, a minor point, uh, but it's a point that it, it does at times uh, seem important to me is I really appreciate the fact that the pages were numbered so that when I was trying to find things and go back, um, I could look at my notes and see what page it was on. So I really would hope that uh, that becomes standard practice for the staff to include page numbers on the staff report. Uh, thanks. There is, like others, uh, as others have said, a number of things I think are really positive about this uh, project. Um, I think the downtown is the place for higher density development. And I also particularly think the connection uh, with the river is you know, you know, an important and desirable public amenity. And I'm, I'm glad this project is, is, is starting the, the it's the first, and I hope, a number that are going to be uh, coming forward that would provide that kind of river walk and make the, uh, the river a really uh, a real desirable destination. I also appreciate that, uh, that there are three separate buildings, and the, the architect and the developer have avoided uh, uh, un, undue massing and have been able to figure out a way to um, to present the project in a way that does kind of work architecturally, at least from my perspective. So I think there's a good deal that's good about the project, and I'm, uh, overall I'm supportive of it. The area where I have problems with it and where I think the, um, the recommendation is inadequate has to do with affordable, the affordable housing provision. Um, with a 175-unit project, Yes, it's nice to have, it's, it's a benefit to have 20 uh, low and very low income units, but that's 11% of the number of units. Uh, and as some of the testimony has said, and as commissioners know, the crisis uh, in the community for affordable housing is an, an overwhelming one. So from my perspective, it's, um, I read the staff, uh, the memo from the planning director regarding the uh, density bonus case. Um, coming out of Napa, 
And I think there are reasons why it really isn't applicable here, but I think there are other reasons why it is not really either necessary or desirable to essentially call, <clears throat> um, to make the inclusionary units the same as most of the density, affordable density bonus units. One of the, <clears throat> the sections of the density bonus law says, this section does not supersede or in any way uh, alter or lessen the effect of the California Coastal Act. And uh, one of the policies of the California Coastal Act is a primary purpose of a coastal permit is to ensure that, oh, I'm sorry, um, in carrying out the requirements of the Constitution, Article 10, Section 4, maximum access shall be provided, I'm pulling out words, maximum access shall be provided to all the people by not, by not counting the <clears throat> affordable uh, density bonus units uh, separately from the inclusionary units, I think that it's the, the city would not be acting consistent with the public access project, project, project policy in the, in the Coastal Act. The other um, issue, another issue has to do with um, a fundamental difference between the city's inclusionary program and the inclusionary program that was thrown out in the Napa case. Napa adopted, Napa County adopted an inclusionary program um, clearly as a way to um, undermine the density bonus provisions. And the case really speaks to the, the, the inclusionary program can't be used to prevent density bonus units. Uh, or the provision of density bonus. That's not what's going on here. There's no question that um, the project is eligible and sh can receive density bonus units. The question is, there are t the issue is there are two separate um, provisions. One is the inclusionary ordinance that's been in effect since 1980 and says that projects of five units or more shall provide um, uh, at least 15% of their units to low and moderate income um, households. The density bonus law is a separate law, and it says that under certain provisions, the, the, to include, uh, to, to achieve a density bonus, the, the project shall provide a number of very low or low in, income units. That's not, um, it seems to me that the, 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 the city um, has the ability to, um, to count those, um, those two requirements separately. And even the staff report, which, uh, you know, uh, the, the staff memo says the, the, the case and the law allows the city to count density bonus units um, as um, inclusionary units. I think that's true. The city can do that. I don't think it has to do that. I think given the history of the inclusionary ordinance in the city and the way it's been applied uh, and the way it's being applied here, it's not being applied to the density bonus units, it's not being applied to the total project, it's being applied simply to the base density. The, uh, the density bonus units have their own affordability requirements and I think they should be additive and not um, uh, piled one on top of the other. Finally, I think the, I, I want to sort of cite the Housing Accountability Act, because the Housing Accountability Act, I think, is relevant here. Um, it provides that nothing uh, uh, shall be con in the ordinance, in the act, shall be construed to prohibit a local agency from requiring the housing development project to comply with objective, quantifiable, written development standards, conditions, and policies appropriate to and consistent with meeting the jurisdiction's share of the regional housing need. As has been mentioned in public testimony and by commissioners and staff, um, the number of very low income housing units that are being provided by the city is way below what our housing need is. Um, having an objective standard which is Counting, counting the inclusionary units separately from the affordable units, density bonus units, is a reasonable objective standard um, for, um, 
for application to housing development to help the city meet its density bonus requirements and the law also says they this the standards cannot reduce the number of units and it's not reducing the number of units it still would allow for the same hundred and seventy five units so my my position is my point of view is that uh, while the city does have the ability to you know limit the number of affordable units to 11 percent it also has the ability to add the um, add the uh, density bonus affordable units to the inclusionary units and provide a higher level of affordability which is the greatest need that we have in, in the city in terms of additional housing units so I I am supportive of the project I support a motion um, to recommend approval of the project but I would hope that motion would include uh, the, uh, the change in the recommendation to uh, count the uh, uh, inclusionary units in addition to the um, affordable density bonus units. So those are my comments. Um, uh, Julie, I see your hand up. Did you want to respond? I did. Uh, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that, Andy. Um, we need more affordable housing. There's absolutely no question about it. And um, we particularly need it for the most deeply targeted um, folks in our, in our city. And I, there's a number of things about the density bonus law that isn't, isn't my favorite. Um, and the way that it gets used, I mentioned earlier, particularly in MAP projects, um, you know, working with 50% AMI households to become homeowners is really challenging for a whole layer of reasons that is not appropriate to this conversation. So, yeah, there's a lot of flaws in it, and I agree with that. Um, I also um, really strongly believe and and know from my experience that the tools that we really need to provide affordable housing that is deeply targeted um, really include public financing. Um, the density bonus law, what it does do is it gives us an opportunity, it gives a, a private developer um, a, a way to make a deeply targeted project pencil. Um, which this, this project has done. Um, like I said, it's not, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to say I love the way um, affordable housing is, is um, met through this project, but I think that the way it is being met is um, exactly where our current status of the density bonus law is designed to target it. And um, I would say that it is, I just want to point out that it has been well tested in many communities. I mean, um, most communities, when they were doing, uh, who had inclusionary uh, ordinances, when the density bonus came out, it was like, okay, great, then we get more. We get to stack it. And, um, and but you know, you got to give us what you owe us, and then you get some density. And that has been refuted more and more clearly. Um, every single time it's been tested. And what I'd like to say is I think that we put the city in a terrible position if we were to do something that is contrary to where we are, where we know it would land in court. It's a terrible time to add um, that kind of cost um, to this project, both to the city and also to the developer. Um, and if, if in fact, we support this project, and if in fact we want to see it built, then the best thing we can do is approve a project that comports with what we know will stand um, through a court challenge. And so um, I am very willing um, to make a motion in support of the project, um, but I would support the staff recommendation and applying the density bonus um, the way it is proposed. Okay, um, 
planning director has his hand up. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chair Schifrin. Um, I, I'd like to echo some of those comments as well as that, you know, as, as staff, we always seek to um, maximize the amount of affordability and recognize that um, affordable housing is the greatest need that we have, uh, more so than market rate housing. Um, I, I will say um, to what Commissioner Conway was saying, uh, in personal experience, I have worked in a prior jurisdiction where our codes explicitly said um, layer the inclusionary on top of the density bonus. And based on case law, um, our attorneys in those jurisdictions uh, expressly said we can no longer do that. Um, I also, so, so that is, that's um, one uh, point that I wanted to make. I also wanted to, to point out that in both the, um, the inclusionary section of our, our own code and in the density bonus section of the own code, presumably to be consistent with these laws, um, but they are, it is slightly different. And, and I'll, I'll share my screen here um, because um, I'll let you uh, take a look at it. Can you see this uh, code section here? This is in uh, 24.8, sorry, 24.16.020. Um, it, it specifies that dwelling units authorized as part of a density bonus are not counted uh, as part of the residential development for calculating the number of inclusionary units. So that's um, specified here. I'll give you a second. I see you all looking at it. Let me see if I can make this larger, if that's helpful. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Is that better? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I saw people squinting. And then um, there's a corresponding section further down um, that I'll scroll to. It's uh, dot 250 here. Um, Can I just respond to that before you leave there? Sure, yeah, yeah, go right ahead. Uh, because that provision doesn't say, uh, what it says to me is that in determining the number of inclusionary units, the, the de density bonus units shall not be counted. Well, there's no objection to that. We're, the inclusionary units are simply based on the base density. The density bonus units are not being counted in terms of determining the number of inclusionary units. So That's I don't think that, that adding the two requirements violates this section. No, no, these are separate. These are separate. So I just wanted to point them out as related. Um, you know, I think the layering is very clearly articulated in the case law and Latinos Unidos that we unfortunately can't do that. And, um, you know, we've, we've consulted with, again, like I said, um, on our own project in Santa Cruz on this exact same issue um, where the attorney who was representing the county of Napa, who was arguing the case for this, you know, one of the best uh, density bonus and inclusionary attorneys, Barbara Couts uh, uh, with Goldfarb Lippman, um, and she, the, the information that was provided was a quote from that prior analysis, and he concluded in that instance the same thing that we're conveying here, that we don't have an ability to, to stack those. Um, they have to be integrated. Um, and so, so uh, the other section is, is essentially the same. It's related, but it isn't, um, uh, it's not talking about the stacking. It's basically, it's the uh, complement to this. So if we go down to 250, I'll just quickly, um, jump there. So here we go, 245. This was the table we were referencing before. And here's this, um, yeah, the density bonus units, um, aren't included. So this was, this was your earlier question. Um, I can't remember which one of you asked that, but, uh, there was a uh, question about can we count uh, the 175 units in the total? And so um, related, you know, I think it, what, I'm, what I'm trying to drive home here is that, you know, we always seek to maximize the number of affordable units that we can get. 
the, the developer or the level of affordability. You know, uh, this table here actually shows that if you're doing, for example, um, lower income, you have to actually provide more units. It's not the 11% to get the 35% density bonus, it would be 20%. And in ownership units, if you're doing moderate, you have to provide 40% of the units to get 35% uh, density bonus. So there are opportunities to get, uh, you know, if, if the applicant is proposing them, to get a higher number. But in this instance and in some others, they, they choose to actually provide the deeper levels of affordability rather than the additional numbers of units. And that's something that they're entitled to do, it, it make that choice as part of the, um, the density bonus application. Well, I think that in my, uh, you know, from my perspective, all that's true, but it doesn't really speak to the issue of can the density bonus issue, can the density bonus affordable units be added to the um, inclusionary units? And sure, I'll pull that info up. Let finish. I listened to you. Let me finish. Um, the the difference between what's going on in Santa Cruz and what went on in Napa is very key. And I understand that attorneys are, are relying on that. But what's different is one: we're in the coastal zone, and there are coastal zone. There's a coastal zone policy that. Um, mandates public access for all people. Two, um, our inclusionary ordinance was adopted by a vote of the people um, and has been in effect for, uh, since 1980. So for, what, 40 years now? And to just say that it, it essentially is uh, subsumed by density bonus, I don't think is necessarily something that courts would require. And then finally, what's new since the Napa case is the Housing Accountability Act, which allows the city to have an objective standard that would uh, help it meet its, uh, its regional housing needs. And I, having the, counting the two uh, requirements uh, as additive is a way, is a legitimate uh, standard. Now, of course, it's a decision that the uh, council would have to make the city might be sued, but this is a key issue, policy issue for the city. How far is the city willing to go to fight to get a ma what you call and what I would call the maximum number of affordable units? And I think the city would have a very strong case given these uh, factors that are very different from what was decided in the Napa case. So that's my perspective on it. Uh, Cindy, and then... Uh, you know, I, come in, uh, Chair... Schiffman, I actually uh, made a motion, and uh, there wasn't a second ask. And, and so I, I think it needs a, a response. Is there a second to the motion to uh, approve the staff recommendation? Uh, I will second I that. I'll second that. And, and the only um, request, um, Commissioner Conway, is that we add in the condition um, regarding the mural. Absolutely, I support that. Okay. Um, what about a condition on the bike ramp? Are you uh, willing to add that into the motion as a friendly amendment? No, not, not for this application, no. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Dawson, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I would just uh, like to also add to the discussion about the affordability that everyone uh, agrees about the crisis level of affordability. And so it's gonna require bold solutions. And if, if the city is serious about it, we're gonna have to make bold decisions around affordability. Um, another uh, thing to consider is the health and all, all policies talks about equity, um, the latest census survey, the annual survey that the community survey that they put out, they put the, the poverty level in the city of Santa Cruz at 24.4%, right? So if, if we're building and developing and we're not developing at that level of affordability, um, we're, we're not achieving equity, period. And so we, we need to be making these bold decisions. And I think that Chair Schifrin really laid out some strong legal 
argument around um, existing law that supports um, these being additive. And so I, I really want us to consider supporting that. I, I am supportive of this project, but I think that we can do better. And I think we can provide 26 units instead of 20 units. And I think we should, I think we should lean in and reach for it. I wonder if any of the commissioners would be willing to uh, make a motion to amend the motion on the floor to um, add the, a provision that the total number of affordable units be based on adding the number of required inclusionary units under the city's ordinance to the number of required affordable units under the city's density bonus um, ordinance and with the basis for these changes being conformity with the Coastal Act policy requiring public access, uh, the city's, secondly, the city's inclusionary requirements being adopted by a vote of the people uh, and, and being in effect since 1980, and that finally the Housing Accountability Act allows the city to um, adopt an, obje uh, an objective condition, um, a, an objective standard that would uh, maximize the city's ability to uh, meet its uh, housing, uh, very low income and low income housing needs. Can you hear me? Sorry. Um, I would be willing to make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. So there's a motion and a second to amend the motion to the floor uh, with the language that I suggested. Uh, let's have some discussion on the amendment. Commissioner Conway. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to speak against that amendment um, because I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I can't say that um, this argument, and they are compelling. I understand why they sound compelling, um, but I do not believe that they will stand, I am certain that they will add cost and time to this project, um, which really goes in the face of, of our sincerity of wanting to get it built. And finally, what I'd like to say is I couldn't agree more with what staff has suggested is their um, constant intent um, to strategize, to maximize the amount the number of units and the depth of, affordable, of affordability for those units, the strategies that work to address those 50% um, AMI and below households is the very one that they took at the Laurel and Pacific project, which was to you know, creatively assemble land to do a deeply targeted um, publicly financed project. Um, and that is the way to meet the need um, for those 50% AMI and below households. Um, and I couldn't agree more um, that it is um, the prime uh, need within this community. So I really appreciate the intent. Um, I don't believe it will stand. It will harm the project. Um, and it's not the right tool to um, meet the need for that uh, targeted income group. Thank you. Any other discussion? Um, seeing none, we'll have a vote on the amendment. Um, can we have a roll call on the amendment? Commissioner Conway? No. Nielsen? No. Greenberg? Yes. Dawson? Yes. Maxwell? Yes. Uh, Chair Shifford? Yes. The amendment passes, and now we'll vote on the main motion, uh, which includes the um, uh, staff recommendation plus the uh, uh, condition on the mural um, that the Arts Commission would be involved in selecting the mural and includes the amended motion on the, uh, adding the, the, the two affordable housing programs. 
Are there any other condition or uh, amendments that anyone would like to make to the main uh, to the motion on the floor? Any further discussion about that motion? Let's vote on the on the main motion. Um, all those in favor say aye. I oh, know. No, I'm sorry. We're going to have to go around and do a roll call. Sorry. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Nielsen? No. Greenberg? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. 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 The motion passes uh, five to one. Um, Please let the record show that I voted against this because of the amendment that was made to the motion. Okay, and let me ask that when this goes to the council, the full motion be presented in the staff report. Is there any problem with that? Are you asking me? Yes. That's a plain no, there's no problem. There's no okay. problem with that. We always do that. Okay, thank you very much. So let me figure out where we are here. Um, we have another um, item which is uh, the general plan zoning ordinance item and um, ordinarily I would take a break now but since we're all sitting at home or at least someplace uh, separate um, let's go right forward could we have a staff report please Hi, yes, good evening. Um, my name is Sarah Noisy. I am a planner in the advanced planning section. Um, and we are bringing forward this informational item for your commission this evening. This was referred by the city council. Excuse me. My keeper was just turning on and it's a little loud. Um, was referred by the city council this evening. Um, they just heard this item last Tuesday and referred it to your commission um, this week. So here we are. Um, our initial plan was that we would update you um, as part of the planning director's report this week, but instead you get to hear my whole um, PowerPoint and you got to read the whole staff report. So congratulations to you. Here we go. So let's start. Um, I'm just going to go through this really briefly. Um, I will share my screen. Okay, so um, this is a project to develop objective standards for multifamily housing. Um, there is a fair amount of background on this. Oh my gosh, sorry, technical issues. <laughs> There's a fair amount of background on this item that I am not going to go into. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to um, go into it and explain sort of the origin and beginning of this project, but just very briefly. Um, the 2030 general plan um, was adopted by the city in 2012. Um, our current zoning code that the city is operating under does not fully implement that general plan. Specifically, there, were, there are three um, mixed use uh, land use designations that aren't reflected in the zoning ordinance. Our zoning ordinance does allow for some mixed use development, but not to the scale and to the residential density capacities that are envisioned in the pattern created by the general plan. So um, due to a fair amount of um, concern in the community, the work on the zoning ordinance amendment to implement the general plan was sort of stopped internally in 2017 and then was formally um, ceased by the City Council in August of 2019. That effort was known as the Corridors Plan. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, the City Council also gave us direction to then begin a new effort at reconciling the difference between our existing general plan and our existing zoning ordinance. Um, as you have just been discussing, the Housing Accountability Act also kind of came into play right at the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. Um, which then also has an effect on the work that we're doing to create multifamily housing and regulate multifamily housing. So um, the city applied for a grant to create objective standards. 
we were successful in achieving that grant. In May of this year, we released a request for proposals and we appropriated the grant funds into our budget. This summer, we've been going through the procurement process and um, selected urban planning partners to work with us in this project. And we're really very excited about working with them. This team is technically very strong urban planning partners, strategic economics, which is already working with the city on our um, economic development strategy. So they already have some local context. And then Interethnica, which is specifically a multicultural marketing and design team that works on um, creating outreach tools that are specifically not only language translated, but culturally translated and targeted to um, groups in the city that have not been involved with the city government as much as we would like. Um, so we're really excited about this team. They are bringing, um, not only have, did their proposal demonstrate sort of a surprisingly nuanced understanding of our community already, um, but they're also, they have a strong focus on education, really ensuring that um, the participation and the engagement that we get from the community is really well informed so people really understand the process to which they are contributing and that they are able to give us comments and, and make suggestions that are really relevant and useful and that they will see in that final product. So we're really interested in that. They, um, one of the things that they are really going to talk about is kind of understanding um, the history of our zoning and our land use patterns that we are currently living with and the forms of housing that we are currently um, creating and living with in the city and sort of where those, the history of where those things came from um, through a social justice and anti-racist lens. Um, this is a really important part of the history of zoning that is often missing. Um, I know we, we do talk about, and I, I heard you in the last item raising concerns about gentrification, and, um, and that's something that is incredibly important in the work we do. And um, where we are in Santa Cruz right now, um, we've actually reached a level of exclusion in many of our neighborhoods where gentrification really is no longer the issue. What we're, we're reaching the next level beyond that, which is genuinely excluding a lot of folks from our community. Um, so I think bringing this point of view and this lens and an education that really backs it up and helps people really understand what we're working for is going to be really helpful and really meaningful in terms of um, the work that the community is going to be able to do with us on creating these standards for multifamily housing. Um, they also have a lot of proven tools for creating the type of participation that we want to see and um, need to have in par as part of this project. So I'm going to run through the scope of work really briefly. Um, this was attached to the item. So if you want you know, more detail on it, the whole contract is there. You can like dig into the scope of work. Um, so the project is beginning immediately. We're already trying to get our kickoff meeting on the schedule for September um, and it will carry us through um, the rest of this year and then into fall and probably through the end of 2021. We do have to be finished with the project because it is grant funded, we have a hard deadline and we have to be finished with the project by um, no later than the end of 2021 and submit our final billing in February. So that really is a hard deadline. The budget is just under $180,000. Um, the total $310,000 grant is split between consultants and staff time. And the, the scope of work consists of four primary tasks. Um, information gathering, where the consultants are really gonna get their arms around what are the city's existing regulations, um, you know, what's the existing condition in terms of the places where these land use, excuse me, um, land use designations and multifamily zoning designations are currently applied in the city. They're going to do a lot of work on community engagement um, and ensuring, helping folks define what it is that they um, want to see in terms of community character, really digging in and um, understanding what is it that people are really interested in preserving about their neighborhoods. People love their neighborhoods and really care a lot. And so let's talk about, let's define that and create a metric for it so that then we can create an objective standard that ensures that we recreate that and bring it forward as we build, you know, these new landmark buildings potentially. I mean, some of these locations where these land use patterns or um, land use designations exist are really key sites in the city. So. Um, the standards really 
uh, are really very important. Then, of course, there is a task to actually draft the standards and then refine them and work with the community to make sure that we're really hitting the mark with that. And then the last task, of course, is public hearings before your commission um, and the city council. So in terms of information gathering, um, I mentioned the kickoff meeting. We're going to, they're going to be doing a review of all of our planning documents to really understand the standards that we currently have in place um, and how those are working or potentially not working as well for us as we would like them to do to be. Um, and they're going to be doing an analysis of sort of the existing economic condition and um, community conditions. Um, I included this poll quote. This was actually a poll. They actually used this in their um, proposal, UPP did. Um, it says, I don't want endless meetings and outreach. I just want housing to get built without any fanfare, except for the new residents being very excited to move in. And that was a quote that came from our work on the housing blueprint a couple years ago. And um, this is one of the challenges that this project is going to face um, in terms of community engagement is that there has been a lot of talk about housing. Um, and I think uh, there are certain contingents in the community who are concerned that it's only talk and that they're not seeing the type of change they had hoped to see. Um, they're not seeing any change. They're not seeing the right kind of change. They're seeing the wrong kind of change. I think there are a variety of opinions out there in the community. And so the community engagement strategy is going to have to be um, really responsive to that, to where we are right now. Um, and part of where we are right now is in the middle of a pandemic. So um, the community engagement that will be included with this project is going to necessarily going to have to um, innovate and use different kinds of tools that perhaps we have used before at a, at a smaller scale. Um, and probably many tools that we haven't used before. So um, that task will include developing the engagement strategy and really laying it all out and being very thoughtful and deliberate about how we are outreaching, how we're reaching out to our community, who in the community we're reaching out to, um, the methods that we're going to use to reach all of those different potentially effective interests. And then task 2C implementation, is that's a task that really lasts almost you know a year of the project so it, it starts it's going to start towards the end of this year and carry us all the way through um, the winter the spring and into next summer so then task three of drafting the objective standards um, will include doing a, a test fit of the existing objective standards and that's um, that's the task to really uh, identify what, which parts of our existing standards work and which parts maybe don't work that well. So one of the things that we have noticed as staff is that um, of the parcels that now carry the mixed use high density um, designation, only one has pursued and acquired uh, an entitlement to redevelop. And that proposal um, includes a much lower um, floor area ratio and a smaller number of units than was than would be permitted under the general plan. So there are maybe very many, there may be many reasons for that and maybe they are good reasons and maybe they are less good reasons and we just need to understand exactly why that is so that we can um, address it to the appropriate degree in these new standards. So that's going to be a really important task, that task 3A and that will occur before the end of this year. Um, so then once we've kind of identified what's working and not working, and then we have the work from the community engagement um, process to talk about what people's preferences and needs are for housing and in their communities, then the next step will be to develop those objectives, those draft objective standards, and then visualize them. So that would include using photographs and diagrams of how the standards might be applied and buildings where they have already been used um, locally or elsewhere. Um, and then getting yet another round of feedback to refine those objective standards before bringing them to formal hearings before the Planning Commission and the City Council, which is task for the public hearings. So um, one of the things that both your commission and the City Council has been interested in 
um, is the role that the planning commission will play in this process. And we as staff and consultants, we want to ensure that the planning commission really can add value. You all have um, expertise and you have experience and you have um, some institutional knowledge that the rest of the community doesn't have. Um, and so we want to find the appropriate place to have that plug into this process. So one of the thing, one of the ways that that's typically done is through a community advisory commission or a technical advisory commission that then a subcommittee of the planning commission would be a member of. Um, and out of the four proposals that we got, there was not one that included that as one of the outreach tools. And um, in through the interview process and in talking with UPP also, the you know, the firm we selected, um, all of them said, if you want broad and inclusive outreach, you want to bring in new voices who haven't participated, you need new and different tools. Um, using this type of uh, format of meetings really reinforces existing power structures. And so if you're looking for a process that's going to challenge that and bring something new and different and create something new and different, um, you need a different approach. So we are recommending that your commission play an important advisory role in this process where staff and consultants would bring detailed updates at four milestones. With the community engagement strategy, so that would be later this fall, um, to sort of review that community engagement strategy provide any feedback or new different ideas, um, blind spots we may have, um, just another opportunity to, to daylight that product for the public so they can see it and make comments in a public hearing. Um, we think your commission can be really helpful there. Um, the next step would be at the results of that test fit for the existing standards. So that point in the process is a really important piece because that's the point where the city will be um, will have the information necessary to decide um, if a general plan amendment might actually be necessary. So one of the things that the Housing Accountability Act does is um, it essentially states that um, municipalities can't downzone overall. So you can't reduce the number of, of development of, what am I trying to say? You can't reduce the number of housing units that are currently planned for in the city. So the city has some overall number of um, housing units. And we, if we are reducing the capacity of one site for whatever good reason, we need to simultaneously be increasing the development capacity of another site. So um, there has been some question as to whether that might be necessary or appropriate, given the um, concern that has arisen around this mixed use high density designation specifically. That point of the results from the test fit is going to be the point where the city will have the information to make a choice about whether we launch a new project to amend the general plan or whether we um, work with the general plan that we have, write objective standards that we are comfortable with. Um, and then build the housing that we all know and agree that we need. Uh, so the third step is that the visualization of the draft standards. Um, oh, so I should, I'm sorry, let me back up a sec. So the results of that um, test fit, at that point, your commission would be making a recommendation to the city council. So we would be bringing a staff recommendation and the results of that work. We would have a staff recommendation about you know, launching a new project or what the next step should be, and then your, the commission would make a recommendation to the city council as to how to proceed. The next step at the visualization of the draft standards, um, so at the point where we have the draft standards, you know, sort of drafted, visualized, um, we would be bringing them to the planning commission for a first read and for feedback to staff and consultants that would go into that refining step. Um, and then we would refine the, the objective standards and bring them back to your commission for a formal hearing and your commission would then make, be making a recommendation to the city council. So this next part at the city council meeting, I had the consultants with us and they introduced themselves and you know they were lovely and you can watch the hearing if you wanna hear from them. Um, they are a woman owned firm, they're based in the Bay Area. They have done lots of work all around the Bay Area um, they have a really great track record of um, completing projects on time, on budget, um, with really good successful results. Not just summing up what they said. 
And then we came to our staff recommendation. This was our staff recommendation to um, the city council <clears throat> at the time, which I put in your staff report. They passed this motion and then added a few other things to um, uh, direct staff to um, bring more planning commission commentary into the process. Um, and we are, you know, sort of going to be doing that through the milestone check-in. Um, and I'm forgetting what the other thing was. I have the motion in front of me. It was in your packet. So anyway, it's, I'm here to answer any questions that you could have. to the commission. I'm sorry? It was to present to the commission what the council had oh. done. Here. Oh, so there you go. Why are you here tonight? Here I am. <laughs> so, um, if you still want to talk about it, we can. I can answer any questions. You can have any discussion. This is an informational item, so there's no action required. Um, are there any initial commission questions? Is there anybody? From, well, let's see if there's any from the, anybody from the public who wants to speak on speak on this item. <laughs> I don't see that any members of the public have raised their hand. If there are any members of the public that like to speak to this item, please press star nine now. Any public member want to speak on this? Not Sorry, Chair. I don't see any members of the public that have indicated they wish to speak. If there is a member of the public that wishes to address this item, please press star nine now. No hands. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. Um, I'm, yes, Commissioner Dawson, why don't you lead off? Hi, thanks so much for that report. Um, so I just wanted to get straight into, um, I think this is a comment, might be a question, we'll see. Um, so uh, I, I read the staff report and um, hear what uh, you're saying about having the role of the commission. I just like to express that I really have concerns about um, not having a more formalized role for the planning commission. Um, as you point out, these are going to be incredibly important moving forward and really set uh, the foundation of, of development moving forward in the city. Um, the planning commissioners, uh, especially my colleagues, bring a lot of experience and knowledge about planning and development and different expertise. Um, and I also just want to point out that, you know, the, the point of attack, like a technical advisory committee, is not necessarily related to outreach to the community. It was kind of lumped under there as that would somehow be outreach to the community. But what, what they bring, or a science advisory committee, is they bring a technical expertise. And so the way this is laid out with PASS 2 being a, a comprehensive um, kind of new approach to community engagement, serving as the foundation to build the objective standards for, um, there seems to me in task three a, a formal role for the commission, and um, I, I hope there would be um, some consideration for that, and um, maybe we can hear from other commissioners and see what they think as well. Yes, uh, Commissioner Conway. You have to unmute yourself. You're muted, Julie. <laughs> You're still muted. Got okay. it. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you very much for the staff report, and I really appreciate that the council sent it to us to hear specifically. I know the whole schedule, everything has gotten off schedule in how we've moved forward um, this for the last seven or eight months. So um, I'm, I'm glad that they sent it to us. And, yeah, I guess I really do disagree with Commissioner Dawson on the point. I thought it was really clear. I agree that the, I mean, the planning commissioner, planning commission has a very clear role in, um, you know, adopting ordinances and as serving as a public forum um, for, you know, for, and so every time it comes to us, I hope that we have 
really good participation from that part of the community that goes to meetings and um, uses meetings to articulate their needs. But I am so excited to have a means to reach everybody else, um, and, uh, so, and, and especially particularly taking a social justice, anti-racist approach um, and really making sure that we get the voices included in this is really exciting to me. It was one of the most heartening scopes of work that I've read, in, and I've read a lot of scopes of work in my day. Um, so I, I want to thank staff for doing that, and um, I'm very satisfied with both the role of the Planning Commission and more than that, the acknowledgement of the Council um, of the importance of articulating the role of the Planning Commission. Um, so I just, I just want to thank you, and I'm excited to see it get started. Other commissioners have initial comments? I have, I want to really appreciate the staff report. Um, when I, to the, to the commission, when I read the agenda item, it seemed like uh, the court is planning redo. It was all, uh, it's all focused on um, cities interested in determining whether existing development standards and guidelines are a, bar a barrier to development of multifamily housing. How are we going to develop more multifamily housing? That's fitting to determine if there are physical factors preventing development from reaching the 2.75 far allowed in the general. I give the page number of the staff report, but they don't have page numbers. Uh, these findings will help the city understand what factors, physical, economic, and regulatory, may be prevent, pre preventing properties with mixed use general plan land use designations from pursuing redevelopment. So it's all focused reading the staff report and the sections of the contract on how are we going to get more development, how are we going to get more development. That was not my sense of what the objective standards are all about. And I really liked a lot of the things that um, you said um, in terms of your presentation because it goes way beyond that. The contract doesn't mention anywhere the importance of affordable housing. I mean, how can we talk about fighting um, um, for social justice when there's no even mention of the need for affordable housing. And the, the section, again, of the, um, the, the Housing Accountability Act is nothing in, uh, in, the ordin in the law shall be construed to prohibit a local agency from requiring the housing development project to comply with objective quantified written development standards, conditions, and policies appropriate to and consistent with meeting the jurisdiction's share of the regional housing need. So I think it's very important that this, um, this process, and I think from things that you said, I don't feel it's inconsistent with what you said to have this process really be looking at what are the affordable housing needs, because I have a feeling uh, as the participatory process expands, and I think it's great that it does expand to previous communities that previously haven't participated very much, I'll, I'll be shocked if affordable housing isn't a big concern of those communities. Mm -hmm. And I think as uh, we've, we've said, at least some of us have argued over and over again, simply providing high density development is not going to do much for affordable housing. So I think it's important that um, the, the, the that the need for affordable housing or the issue of affordable mm -hmm. housing and how it might integrate into objective standards be integrated into this process. The other thing I would mention is the importance of neighborhood, uh, the quality of life in neighborhood. One of the, cons you know, when I first came to Santa Cruz in the early 70s, there were still people who remembered what Santa Cruz was like before the university came. And in fact, Santa Cruz was considered a seedy little resort town that had about 50% of the housing units with, uh, were lived in by seniors who were uh, of lower income. And in fact, as you see in the Circles neighborhood and other neighborhoods, there are very small lots that had very, uh, very uh, affordable housing. And it's not, you know, the, certainly the, the demands have changed, but the need for the affordable housing has remained the same. And how to um, provide for additional affordable housing through regulatory changes, 
through um, through land, uh, zoning changes is a is a very I think could be a very important part of developing objective standards for develop for development rather than just trying to figure out how can we get the maximum density in the mixed use projects. Um, so I, I hope that those will be taken into consideration. Certainly, I'm going to be looking at that. Mm -hmm. This doesn't become the, the definition of objective standards is how can we increase density uh, and allow for the maximum density everywhere that well, we can. I think density is important, mm -hmm. but not the only value. The final request, and it's kind of a in between with what Commissioner Conway and Commissioner Dawson was saying, I, I appreciate the, the times that the staff is recommending coming to the commission for the commission's input. I think the, 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 it does make sense. The only request that I would make uh, and ask the, the staff to consider, I think it will be very important for the commission to consider the task 3, at, to, to hear from the consultants and staff at the time the task 3B is being done, which is the, you know, the development of um, the draft objective standards. That's what we're going to end up with, and I think it's important to get the commission's input at the time those standards are being um, developed by the consultants and staff so that when they come back during the visualization of those standards, they'll, they'll reflect um, input and hopefully be uh, responsive to the concerns that the commission has. So I don't know whether, you know, from my perspective, I'd rather have a, a report from uh, an update from the consultant and staff around task 3B rather than 3A, but I can see why 3A is relevant too. But I think both of those tasks, uh, particularly 3B, would be very important to have the commission have input. So um, I understand that the, the council has given direction, the contract has been approved. Um, I do appreciate your staff report because I think it it, it recognized a broader vision uh, for what this process is going to be than what I read in the, uh, in the staff report and the contract. Um, and I hope that it will be possible to, be, to integrate more explicitly affordable housing concerns, neighborhood quality of life concerns, um, as well as giving the commission a chance to provide input when we have, uh, when the draft objective standards are um, being worked on. So well, those are my comments. Um, yes, Commissioner mm -hmm. Greenberg, did you want to say something? You have to. Yeah. 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 Um, yes, thank you so much um, to the to the planning department um, and for all of the work being done on this. Um, I think it's very exciting that this is going to be a focus, um, and particularly with consultants who are targeting, you know, seeking to target audiences publics that haven't been included as much in conversations in the past. Um, I think that um, kind of referencing some things that have been said um, previously, including um, Sarah's point about, you know, becoming, moving from a gentrified community to an exclusionary community, one of the things that can happen is that, um, you know, many people in this community have already been displaced. Uh, many people are living in precarious situations and, you know, majority are renters and can't necessarily come to all of these community meetings discussing housing. And so when you have a, you know, a neighborhood meeting um, in which the neighborhood is already, uh, you know, people have already had to move out of that neighborhood, uh, many of the people who are there um, and come to meetings historically are, are homeowners. Um, who are more securely located in that community. And so I think it's wonderful that there's going to be um, a really proactive effort to bring in um, other, other voices of, of stakeholders um, around how development is going to happen in Santa Cruz, people who would want to live in this, in this community. So, you know, there are definitions of displacement that include direct and indirect displacement, indirect displacement being, you know, direct displacement being those who are pushed out, indirect displacement being those who can't move in. Um, and so um, I think it's really, it's really wonderful that this is going to be a focus and that the focus is going to be then also um, along lines of social justice um, and issues 
um, of race and social justice in particular, which have a, a long history in this community where um, neighborhood groups have often tried to mandate large lot single family home zoning that has had the effect of de facto segregation in Santa Cruz. Um, and so I agree that, um, you know, with, with uh, uh, echoing Chair Schifrin, that density, you know, is kind of necessary but not sufficient, um, that we need mixed housing types, we need to have um, we need to have more density and multifamily housing um, to counter that. So I understand the kind of spirit of that because there was this effort and has been this effort not only in the city but in the county to down zone and to, to mandate large lot single family home zoning. Um, and we need to push back against that and figure out why it is and what, what the roadblocks have been towards multifamily housing. So I really appreciate the spirit of that at the same time that um, I think figuring out ways also of uh, really expanding on affordability in a variety of ways within that density is going to be key because without that density, you can just have a kind of turbocharged, you know, kind of uh, densification that also turbocharges uh, gentrification. Um, and so how do you mix affordability with density is really going to be um, key and, you know, referencing uh, Commissioner Conway's earlier point about figuring out multiple ways of financing that housing, um, obviously inclusionary zoning ordinances and density bonus laws and so forth are, are one small piece of this puzzle. Um, and how do we combine these conversations with really robust discussions around financing, around questions of land use, um, and, uh, and also of, um, of ownership and control of land and the question of potentially community land trusts that can uh, also ensure uh, deed-restricted housing and long-term affordability um, or affordability and perpetuity, um, I think will be a really important part of that conversation. So um, I can imagine this is gonna be a really uh, important way to bring the community together in the aftermath of these fires, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of, you know, this. Already, you know, already we've had this unprecedented housing crisis in this community, and we're in such a such an important moment now to try to shift mm -hmm. gears and to take, um, as Commissioner uh, Dawson was saying, bold uh, new kinds of action to really move the needle here and um, expand our affordable housing stock. So um, I really appreciate that this is happening, and I'm very excited to see where it leads us. Um, and thank you for taking leadership on this issue. <laughs> Any other commissioners have comments on this uh, on this item? Does staff have a response to the comments that uh, commissioners have made? Um, so I guess so. The only response I would make, um, you know, affordable housing is an incredibly important issue. Um, your commission grapples with it. We grapple with it as staff. Um, I know that the, the inclusionary ordinance is going to be coming back to you soon, but next, at, our next. at your next meeting. Okay. So, um, so that really is the tool, like the, the most robust tool that we as the city have in terms of like really kind of ensuring and guaranteeing affordable housing. What this project is going to do, uh, so, so let's recall too, we're talking about objective zoning standards. So this project on its own will not be adjusting the map of where these districts exist. So we have maps in our general plan that lay out land use pattern, land use designations. We have zoning maps that have zoning designations. This project is talking about what do we require of development that's proposed on those properties. Can we make it work at the capacities that it is currently planned for? Because the HAA says we, if we can't, then we need to move that density somewhere else. So should it come, should our determination be at task 3A that, you know what, we, can't, we actually can't fit 2.75 FAR or it's like, it's not gonna work, no one's gonna build it. And what would work better would be two or 2.25 or I don't know what. Um, at that point, um, we will be coming to your commission to ask for a recommendation to go to the city council about like, how should we respond to that? Should we 
try to change our land use pattern? Should we initiate a general plan land use amendment? Um, that's going to be a really important conversation. And I think that's, that's the place where we're really going to get into some of these um, other issues about like whose neighborhood is affected and um, how do we, you know, how do we want to accommodate the growth that's already happening in our city and where does it belong and how does that interact with all of our other goals of the city, um, including affordability. Are there ways that we could arrange our land use patterns so that it more naturally supports affordable housing or even lower cost market rate housing because there are there is a deep need for affordable housing, probably an insatiable need for affordable housing. There is also a very real need for entry level market rate housing and market rate rental housing, um, which these standards can affect. And more than anything, I think the, the idea of having objective standards as opposed to requiring design review for all multifamily housing is that it creates a level of certainty for developers that we hope will make them more inclined to pursue small multifamily rental pro housing projects. I will be very transparent in saying, I believe we need more housing at every income level. I, affordable housing is the greatest need that we have, without a doubt. The deeper the level of affordability, the more important I believe it is. And I believe that we need lots of market rate housing as well in all forms. So this project will really be focused on um, setting the standards for that, you know, multifamily housing as it gets developed over time. Um, in terms of bringing back, you know, task 3B versus task, task 3A, um, I really think task 3A is, a, is way more interesting and honestly more important um, that said, um, we probably could also come back at the point that Task 3B is coming to fruition. We could, you know, get some more feedback. Let me also mention that um, it is also our sincere hope that you, as planning commissioners, will also participate in our public outreach processes and be involved with the community, alongside the community, as this sort of decentralized process is taking place and these conversations are happening and folks are identifying what they want to see when they see new uh, multifamily get built in their neighborhoods or in neighborhoods where they work or in other parts of the city or in places where they might want to live. Um, so there will be all, always opportunities for you as individuals, potentially also in your role at planning commissioners, to provide input into this um, process. And... Um, just really excited to work on it. So, um, any, I think that's all that I wanted to say. So, let me respond and see if I'm understanding what you're saying. Um, and that is that the focus may, will, may be on, the, on multifamily housing, but it's in the context of looking at uh, affordable, affordability issues and neighborhood issues as well. Um, and those are going to be part of the discussion while um, it, the focus has to be on the, <clears throat> the density levels allowed under the general plan. Am I understanding that correctly, that, you, that um, you know, there will be consideration of other forms of housing that might be um, lower cost? Um, and you know, there, what I heard you say is that there's a wide range of things that can be looked at in terms of how to meet the uh, cities need for more housing and the cities need for additional affordable housing. And to mm -hmm. the extent I'm understanding that correctly, I feel that, you know, it's a, that could be a, a worthwhile pro process. Um, and I do also appreciate that you consider coming to us with three, at the time of 3B as well, even if it's just the staff to get some, uh, let us know where, the, where you and the consultants are at so that we could provide some input. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll think about this. You know, in terms of our timeline, I I don't want to um, uh, I don't want to understate that this is kind of a tight timeline that we're working on. It's just a little bit over a year, um, and so 
um, I'm going to hesitate by making commitment that we will bring it, but we will, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll definitely think about it. And I hope that you will all participate in the community engagement process. So, but um, let me be really clear. So the, the final product that's going to come out of this is going to be a set of development standards for multifamily housing. So all, any, any site that is, that carries a multifamily zoning designation or um, a multifamily or mixed use general plan land use designation. What we will come out of this with is a set of development standards that will um, accommodate and regulate the development on those sites at the capacity at which it is currently permitted under our guiding documents, which is the zoning ordinance and the general plan. So that's why this path under 3A is so crucial. If there is a determination made that we cannot accommodate a 2.75 FAR in any kind of acceptable building form, we will need to make another choice about those land use designations. If we need to remove some of the development capacity from those parcels, we will have to put it elsewhere in the city. That will be a different project from this project, but we are going to get the information we need to make that determination through the work we do on the zoning ordinance. Um, maybe we can make 2.75 FAR work. Maybe we will love it. I don't know. I'm trying to keep a very open mind and not make any determinations. We're going to do an analysis. We're going to see what works, what fits. We're going to compare that to where we are going with our community outreach and what we are hearing from the community about what they like to see and how they envision and what they long for in Santa Cruz. Um, so, Maybe we will have zoning that just fully implements the general plan and we won't have to do a general plan that amendment and we will move forward with the land use pattern that was established by that community process in you know, the early 2010s. Um, maybe we won't and we'll have to come up with some kind of alternative plan. Um, I want to hesitate. I want to be clear that we are not specifically talking about a plan for affordable housing. We are talking about multifamily housing, which will include both market rate and affordable development. It is my sincere hope and belief that if we make it clearer and easier to develop multifamily housing, it will happen at a lower price point. Whether that will be deed restricted affordable housing all the time, I think that's unlikely. Um, hopefully it will be more frequent than it is currently. And hopefully the market rate housing that we do develop will be able to come in at a lower price point because their process was shorter, so their carrying costs were lower. They had a predictable outcome, so they had fewer permit fees to pay. They, had, they knew exactly what materials they had to use so they didn't have to you know, change their process midway through. So, I think there's a lot of evidence that shows that that really can happen in you know, other places that have done this. They've seen those kinds of changes. Um, it also gives the community the certainty that they don't have to worry about what might come. They know exactly what can be built. And they've contributed to make sure that if they don't love it, they can at least accept it and live with it. And hopefully they'll love it. I really believe that big multifamily and mixed use projects are keystones in a community. And they can be places, they can create beautiful, vibrant, amazing places to be. And I think Santa Cruz deserves that. We deserve it in downtown and we're getting it. And we deserve it out everywhere. Every neighborhood deserves wonderful places. And multifamily housing is a piece of that. Well, uh, Commissioner Nielsen. I just wanted to thank um, I just want to thank you, Sarah, for just clarifying that. Um, that really makes it very clear. So thank you. Um, I um, I could just tell you from experience that um, assurances that objective standards put in place for developers make a big difference. So whatever can be done to make that process easier, so that these things can get designed and built, is um, is certainly important. So, um, so I look forward to seeing this developed and seeing where it goes. So thank you. Anybody else from the commission? Okay, um, we could take an action if anybody wants to 
Well, otherwise, this is an information item. We don't have to take an action. Um, does anybody want to make a motion? Not seeing anyone. Um, I'll just thank staff for the presentation. Um, at, at times I felt good about it. At times I didn't feel so good about it. So we're just going to have to wait and see how it uh, how this all develops. Um, so let's move on. Are there any subcommittee? Thank you again, uh, Ms. and um, for your report and answering the, our questions. Are there any subcommittee or advisory body oral reports? We will be getting the inclusionary ordinance next uh, at our next meeting. I see uh, the planning director has reappeared. Uh, did you want to say anything now that you're uh, un unmuted? Uh, yes, Mr. <coughs> Chair Schiffer, I was just going to give a quick update um, on uh, things that are upcoming. You've got uh, at your next meeting both the inclusionary ordinance as well as a number of other ordinance amendments. Um, we've got some parking changes that will be before you as well as uh, a whole series of cleanup items, many of which are minor, but um, some that may be of interest. Uh, there are some cleanup items related to ADUs, um, accessory buildings, um, home occupations, um, those will all be uh, integrated in, and they're all relatively minor, um, but uh, there are quite a few of them. So uh, we will have a, a good uh, discussion at our meeting on the 17th for those. And then um, at the meeting on the 1st, um, we would anticipate the WARF master plan coming to um, the Planning Commission. And then um, whether at the first or per, sometime in October, maybe the 15th, we're also looking at the um, Housing Matters Coral Street development that um, will be coming before you. And that is um, an SRO, a, a single room occupancy project um, on Coral Street at the corner of uh, Highway 9 uh, and Highway 1 there. So uh, lots of important things coming up soon for you. I had understood that the uh, Wolf Master Plan was going to be on our next agenda. You're, you're saying it's, it's going to be on the first? I believe, I believe it's going to be on the, the first of October. Um, and uh, we, were, we were aiming for, we were trying to get it to the 17th, but um, the, the last I heard, it's going to be on the first. And so um, we, uh, I think, I think that's where it's it's ending up based on the noticing timelines and the other lead times that we've got right now. Has the final EIR been released on the Wolf Master Plan? I don't believe that it has. I think they are making the final uh, revision still, and so I think that is uh, almost ready, but hasn't quite been released. Would you notify or send a link to commissioners when it is released? Because if it's coming in October, reviewing the draft EIR and the final EIR um, prior to having to make a recommendation on the plan itself, I think the more time that the commission has, the better. Happy to do that. Any questions of the planning director? Um, so we've gotten items referred to future agendas. I guess that's what we were just talking about. There's no other business. Uh, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. Um, Good night.